Hello, good morning and welcome to News File. This is your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, as always, we put Ghana first. Now, Ghana begins talks seeking to get some 3 billion United States dollars from the IMF. This is a country known globally to be somehow rich in gold, in cocoa, and producing oil. How would it be at the brink of death defaults? Local banks, are they at risk of a bout of major crisis as a result? The CD has lost 39% to the world's, to become the world's second worst, according to the Bloomberg. We're told that the solution to our current crisis is beyond the potential 3 billion IMF bailout. So what is going on? And Fitch worsens our situation and deepen concerns of debt restructuring by further downgrading our junk status. We're examining the options or measures and the rescue plan to economic stability. And then we'll be asking if the NDC is justified in beating the world drums so early over the EC's Ghana card constitutional instruments. They say they will mobilize and do everything they can in their power to resist the EC because they suspect a sinister move intended to skew the election system against the party. I'm Samson Ladia Nyanini. We'll be right back to deal with the Vex Martyrs. Oh, Charlie, close your window small. Ah, your room be too bright, oh. Why, you be vampire when you know they like sunlight. Oh, my guy, my eyes, oh, my eyes. Behind the PC problem. Oh, in the sun problem. Come on, light bulb, sir. This no matter. Hmm? I beg, go Robert and Sons. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Then my chick to him, I know correct. Crap. Where Robert and Sons sort them out sharp. Now, so so stylish frames in the wrong. <laughs> we go go Robert and Sons right here. No, I was sitting inside proper. For over 25 years, Robert and Sons continues to provide specialist eye care for both adults and children. Locate us at Adabaka, Adenta, Kumasi, Usudangwa, Tema, Weja, and East Legon. Call 050 151 9111. Robert and Sons, seeing is believing. Since inception, almost 100% of Ashesi University students have found jobs, started businesses, or gone on to graduate school within six months of graduation. From Accra to Nairobi, London to New York, Ashesi graduates are noticed and they are leading successful careers. If you dream of a rewarding life and career, an Ashesi education prepares you for just that. Learn more about applying to Ashesi at www.ashesi.edu.gh. Remember, admission is ongoing. Hannah and Paul have asked their family and friends to join them here today to reaffirm their wedding vows since the first time. Hannah, Paul. You're the tenant of my heart, often behind in the rent, but impossible to evict. Ten years. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't do it any different. Your car breaking down, the lift, meeting you at Auto Chill, and from then on, one chill leading to the other. I have changed my car six times since. But never my air conditioner dollars, nor you, my wife. <laughs> For expert craftsmanship and impeccable after-sales service, Auto Chill has it all. 
Auto Chill is located at Lati Junction next to the Washington Bay. Telephone 0243-474-788 or 0244-365-447. Auto Chill. Stay chilled. It's week three of the Bet Power Ghana Premier League. Turn on your Star Times decoder. Get on your Star Times on app. It's time to watch the long awaited mega encounter. Fabulous Kumasi Asante Kotoko host mighty Accra Hearts of Oak this Sunday, the 25th of September. Seidu Zebo versus Samuel Boedu, part one. It's the GPL Super Clash. Phobia or Fabulous. Get your Star Times decoder or download the Star Times on app to watch this unmissable match. Ebeye Butubutu, showing live in HD on Star Times at Ipa Channel 247. Star Times, enjoy digital life. Football's greatest season is here, and DSTV is the stadium with all the action. Enjoy every single match from the FIFA World Cup, Premier League, La Liga, Serie A, the UEFA Europa League, and the UEFA Champions League. The greatest football from the greatest leagues around the world. Ronaldo, Haaland, Messi, Salah, Athena Jan, and Benzema. All week, every week. Get your decoder today for just 169 Ghana CDs and upgrade to compact and be part of sports' greatest stadium only on DSTV. DSTV, it's your moment. Be the Oscar season and you can win a share of 3 million CDs in prizes, including a trip to Qatar and fuel vouchers. You could even walk away with a grand prize of 250,000 Ghana CDs in cash. A cost to a betway. Enter today at betway.com.gh. This advert has been approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Bet responsibly. Hotel presents Fresh and Guamo with all the great delights. Fufu in a flash with Koto, Yemadie, and Akrantie. Almighty Gobe with Koko and eggs. Ish. Crispy fried chicken with rice, pizzas, and whatever else you're looking for or need to pay for. Hubtel presents Ghana's most useful app. Hubtel is everything you. Welcome back. And here is Samson's stake. Leadership. That is Dr. Yao Osei Educho. This country has never lacked genuine and committed politicians. They have been in short supply, yes. But in our recent history, perfect gentlemen like Kojo Baredu gave us reason to trust some polit- political leaders. Dr. Charles Rekubrobe's Ghana Institute of Public Policy Options, GIPO, has kept the memory of the former finance minister with the annual Baredu Memorial, Memorial Lectures. On Thursday, another great citizen, flying high the flag home and abroad, Bright Simmons, was a speaker at this year's lecture where he revealed to the shock of many 
that about 80% of funds for public procurement does not go through the central accounting or gift mix system established as a means to check corruption largely perpetrated through procurement. He encouraged citizens to try to emulate the courage of Martin A.B.K. Amidu, a man of unquestioned integrity and another great example who gave up his job, first as Attorney General, to fight as a private citizen to recover a dubious 51 million judgment debt to the state. On the second occasion, he sacrificed his office as special prosecutor to save us some $150 million income annually in the dubious and botched Ejapa gold royalties deal. There can be no doubt Dr. Yao Osei Edichum is in the league of rare political leaders who give us reason to be hopeful that what is broken can be fixed. The transformational, generational thinking education minister is not only pioneering the right change in education with STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, but has, as MP, been sponsoring students to study engineering and medicine in the university. He's deliberate about this, and his goal is to produce at least 100 engineers in his Bosumtri constituency in 10 years. It's only two years since he started this project, but he has already put over 90 students in science and technology universities on full scholarship. Yes, he may be confronting particularly capital-intensive issues on the education front, but a hands-on minister who has the experience of successfully running one of the best charter schools in America and is often seen in classrooms making the teaching of math and science enjoyable for students, made many Ghanaians proud this week with his moving speech at the United Nations Transforming Education Summit. Listen to him. A full steam ahead in terms of ensuring that we can increase the numbers of our students participating in STEM and STEAM, and, and that is how we put to rest the issue of rote memorization. You can do rote memorization in STEM. We have to really participate in the learning process and make sure that we can get the critical mass that, with the critical minds that we need for our transformation. You see, I always say that uh, from my experience in the U.S. going back to Ghana, we have good children in Ghana, so respectful. But I go to schools upon schools and I speak with the students. And when I finish speaking with them, I'll say, do you have a question for me? No hand goes up. A hand is just to go up in all my encounters in Ghanaian classrooms. We have tamed the children. We just want them to write down what we tell them. At the day of exams, they should put down what we have told them. We say you are the best student the country has ever known. That kind of education system will not transform Ghana. That kind of education system is not going to give us critical thinking individuals, especially since we are um, in the 21st century and education 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. You can't memorize your way out of poverty, but you can critically think and innovate out of poverty. So Ghanaian schools, Africans will have to begin to take a serious look at what are called assertive curriculum. A curriculum that empowers the African child to ask questions and challenge the status quo respectfully within the African cultural context. But not a curriculum that tells the African child to be quiet and don't say anything when the adult is speaking. And tell the adult back. Tell him back whatever he was told. That kind of education system, I don't care if we get to the point where every African child is in school. If you put all of them in school and do not change the way you teach them by empowering them to be assertive individuals, you still not transform Africa through education.
we cannot deny the truth, this particular truth, that our education hardly produces innovation thinking because pupils and students are not encouraged to be critical and free to challenge the status quo. We can play the ostrich, but that training is the very reason the Ghanaian is generally not assertive. Our bane is the unpatriotic, boot-licking generation and enablers of the unbridled corruption and the near default incompetence on display. A lot is required to get head teachers and others to exercise their Article 21 rights to publicly tell parents and guardians what they deserve to know without fear of undeserved treatment. Even lawyers with special training to not act as timorous souls are failing in this duty. A concern many are excited to know is shared by judges like the Supreme Court's Justice Jones Doche. A few of their colleagues who brave the odds even in making constructive criticisms about the third arm of government, where they earn a living, are taking to the slaughter as though it was sacrilegious to publicly criticize mortal men. Those, I believe, are in the minority who have been giving the judiciary a bad name. Dr. Educhum seems to face the ugly pull-him-down politics, even from within a section of his own political party. But observing from where I sit, much of it is the mud thrown at highly successful leaders that never stick because they are what they are, baseless allegations. Let's support good people to get a reproduction of multiples of good people and goodness in our society. And that is my take. We'll be right back to get to matters of the economy and the NDC's concerns with the Ghana card and the EC's CI that it is seeking to promulgate in Parliament. We'll be right back. Oh, Charlie, close the window small. Ah, your room be too bright, oh. Why, you be vampire where you know they like sunlight. Oh, my guy, my eyes, oh, my eyes. Behind the PC problem. Oh. In the sun problem. Come on, light bulb, sir. This no matter. Eh? I bear go Robert and Sons. Mm. Oh, yeah. Then my chick to him, I know correct. Cra. Where Robert and Sons sort them out sharp. Now, so, so stylish frames in the rock. <laughs> we go go Robert <laughs> and Sons right here. No, I was sitting since I proper. For over 25 years, Robert and Sons continues to provide specialist eye care for both adults and children. Locate us at Adabaka, Adenta, Kumasi, Usudangwa, Tema, Weja, and East Legon. Call 050-151-9111. Robert and Sons, seeing is believing. Hannah and Paul have asked their family and friends to join them here today to reaffirm their wedding vows since the first time. Hannah, Paul. You're the tenant of my heart, often behind in the rent, but impossible to evict. Ten years. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't do it any different. Your car breaking down, the lift, meeting you at Alta Chill, and from then on, one chill leading to the other. I have changed my car six times since. But never my air conditioner's dollars, nor you, my wife. <laughs> For expert craftsmanship and impeccable after-sale service, AutoChill has it all. AutoChill is located at Lati Junction, next to the Washing Bay. Telephone 0243-474-788 or 0244-365-447. AutoChill, stay chilled. The National Petroleum Authority, in collaboration with the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors and under the auspices of the Ministry of Energy and African Refiners and Distributors Association, is organizing the Ghana International Petroleum Conference, GIPCON 2022, live at the Kempinski Hotel, Gold Coast Security, Accra, from the 28th to the 30th of September, 2022. This year's conference is under the theme energy transition 
in the African petroleum downstream context, prospects, challenges, and the way forward. The special guest of honor for the event is His Excellency Ahaji Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, with Honorable Minister for Energy Dr. Matthew Pokupempe also delivering an address. The conference is designed to actively bring to the fore the downstream petroleum industry's perspective and guidance on issues of governmental policy and regulatory framework. GIPCON 2022 will witness a convergence of regulators and downstream industry stakeholders from across the West African sub-region and beyond. It is a unique occasion to connect with many specialists in the downstream petroleum industry from all over the world. For registration, participation, opportunities for exhibition and sponsorship, kindly visit gipcon.com. Hi, my name is Nanama McBrown, and I want to encourage you to dial star 165 hash on MTN to join the My Way family. My Way provides you and a selected family member a cover against death. As a policyholder, you will also have a cover against total permanent disability and hospitalization should you be hospitalized for more than two nights. Dial star 165 hash and join the family. Sanya My Way, Casa No Way. My Way is a product of my life and empty and Momo. Terms and conditions apply. It's week three of the Bet Power Ghana Premier League. Turn on your Star Times decoder. Get on your Star Times on app. It's time to watch the long awaited mega encounter. Fabulous Kumasi Asante Kotoko host mighty Accra Hearts of Oak this Sunday, the 25th of September. Seidu Zebo versus Samuel Boedu. Part 1, it's the GPL Super Clash. Phobia or fabulous? Get your Star Times decoder or download the Star Times on app to watch this unmissable match. Ebeye Butubutu, showing live in HD on Star Times at Ipa Channel 247. Star Times, enjoy digital life. As always, we put Ghana first. Is brought to you by the candid sponsorship of Bank of Africa, as strong as a group and close as a partner. MTN everywhere you go. Star Assurance, your solid partner. Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Robert and Sons Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care service provider for 31 years. Fenat Ghana, think wood, think Fenat. Duroplus, how you get your water matters. Remember, where Duroplus goes, water flows. St. Thomas Eye Hospital, providing excellence in eye care. Hoptel, everything you. And Miwe Insurance, dial star 165 hash on the MTN to join. Now, this morning, my guests on News File. Bright Simmons, Vice President, Simani Africa. Professor Gottfried Bokwing is economist with the University of Ghana Business School. Dr. Theo Champong is economist and political risk analyst. And we also have Samson Akligo, Director, Financial Sector, Ministry of Finance. He's right here in studio. My other guests are joining us via Zoom. In the second segment, we shall be engaging Bright Simmons, Sam Nete George, Member of Parliament, Ningo Pram Pram, Dr. Kojo Pumpuni Asante, Director, Advocacy and Policy Engagement at the CDD, and Dr. Sribo Kweku, who is Director, Electoral Services of the Electoral Commission. Now, we begin by speaking to a Ghanaian citizen, that's all he wants uh, to be introduced. We want to see if he can reflect the views of the ordinary, non-technical, non-economists, the professoral, you know, um, <laughs> inputs about what he sees, feels, or observes as our current situation as far as the economy is concerned. And please send us messages 
on your reality and what your expectations are as a country begins talks with the IMF for a potential three billion United States dollars to cushion it against the harsh, you know, realities that it is suffering now with the CD, you know, uh, almost in a behavior that is unpredictable. And every day things, prices of goods are just going up. Send us messages. What's your reality? What are your expectations? And then we would have our guests also share their views on your reality and your expectations. But we start with Kweku Enchibwe Siakon, who will spend just a brief time to share with us, sort of reflect your views, if you like. Kweku, thank you very much for making time to join us on Newsfile this morning. Good morning, Samson, and good morning to everyone. Great. So you have been writing profusely on social media and also uh, getting online portals like uh, myjohnline.com to publish your, your views about what this country's economy is going through and the prospects of the IMF uh, relief. Let's hear you. As a citizen, I am very, very worried. But beyond that, I'm also very angry. Now, let me illustrate why. Imagine yourself in a bus full of other uh, citizens, other passengers. The driver is speeding along a road full of warning signs that there could be danger ahead. All the protestations of other passengers fall on deaf ears. This driver wouldn't slow down, neither would he even listen to advice to take an alternative route. And the reason he wouldn't take that alternative route is because in the past, he has belittled other drivers who used that route, calling them all sorts of names that they don't have ability and driving skills. And so he is bent on using this particular route Ignoring all the warning signs, in the end, this driver has overshot a ditch and is on the verge of crashing the vehicle into the ditch with the potential of killing some of the passengers, if not all of them. This is how I feel the government has managed this economy. And as a citizen bearing the brand of, as you said, increasing prices, increasing interest rate, affecting mortgages, and everything else you can imagine, I feel this government has been very reckless, bordering on criminality in terms of ignoring all the warning signs for a long time. I know they usually have this refrain of COVID and uh, um, Ukraine war. But you know something, as you have uh, 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 referred to some of the things I've written, way back in November 2020, the warning signs were there after the first, I mean, after the budget for 2021, I started sounding this. And at some point, I felt like I was even harassing you by reminding you every time I see signals pointing to the danger and the risk facing this country and this economy. Back in February, I used a a stark analogy to say that Ghana would have to either go for a controlled explosion by opting for some sort of debt service suspension, or face the real risk of implosion. That's why when this director of Fitch made that comment uh, this week, I referred you to that comment I made. Everybody who had at least a, 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 a scarcely understanding of the economy could see over the 
past several months, things were going downhill. But our economic managers insisted that all was well. I mean, if in February I could see we were heading for implosion, and yet our finance minister and all government officials were saying we were in very good shape, as late as June, her government was still saying we were in good shape. I want to ask just one question. How is it that we had gone through COVID and the worst part of COVID by the end of 2021 and at the beginning of 2022? The Ukraine war started 24th of February. Three, four months down the line, our finance minister, his deputy, were still saying everything was okay, this economy was going to survive, and we were doing very great. And yet now, if at the time, in spite of COVID and Ukraine war, we were supposedly doing fine, how come a month later in July and since then, Ukraine war and COVID have become the reason why we are not doing so well? The least the managers of our economy can do with the people of Ghana is to be very honest and sincere. You cannot be so politically arrogant and, and, and insist on doing things your way because you have previously criticized uh, 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 another government for going to the IMF and just kick the can down the line. We say a stitch in time saves nine. We are where we are now and we are facing real risk of default, as you, you mentioned in your intro, because the government decided not to take options or access options that were available way back in 2021, which could have put this country and the economy in a better shape. We have ignored revenue measures that we could have I mean, deployed several months ago to put this country's economy on sound footing. It, it seems everything that could go wrong has gone wrong because the government decided they just didn't want to take the appropriate measures. And I, I wonder why they still feel they didn't have the moral right to remain in government, let alone to try to gaslight all of us to think that the reasons, the real reasons why we are where we are, are not what it, what they are. So as a, as a citizen, quite frankly, I am angry. I am worried for the future because, I mean, you talk about the, the exchange rate, for instance. You know, way back, several months ago, I told you by 2024, the exchange rate was actually going to be 7.5. That excludes or that, that didn't factor in all the other exogenous uh, factors. And you, you, you have said you couldn't even believe that would happen until you, you, you saw it. Because everything pointed to the fact that this economy was not being managed properly. You cannot manage the economy with your soul being able to go to the euro bond market, which is what has been happening all this while. Having seen anything significant by way of policy or program that could have saved this country short of being able to go to the euro bond so market. So you, you began with such a damaging um, imagery and I hear you use very harsh words. Um, you say you are angry, like um, your friend um, Kwame Sapongesedu said last week, uh, stoic anger, is it? Um, but we deliberately decided that you will speak before the professor so that you don't get influenced by their terminologies and the other things. What are... What are your practical concerns from the ordinary man's point of view 
And what do you see, you know, ahead, at least in positive terms, what the bailout may bring us? Well, if the bailout goes well, and if government will be committed to implementing the agreed program, then possibly, I mean, the CD could stabilize. Because realistically, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, mortgage, for instance, and, I, and I'm speaking from a personal experience, you begin the year, let's say, paying 3,000 uh, uh, CDs. Now you are close to 4,000 CDs. Nothing has changed except that the CD has depreciated. Mm. Okay. So you are, you, are, you are basically having to cough up a thousand more because the economy has not been managed well. If through this IMF program the city were to be stabilized, then you, you don't expect further increases in your monthly repayment. So practically, at least that could be some relief mm. in terms of a uh, 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 mm. cost of Food items, you go to the market every time the prices have gone up. And if you look at how uh, inflation is being managed by the Bank of Ghana, the professors will talk about it. Nothing has been successful since March uh, uh, that they started increasing the, the policy rate. Nothing has changed. It only increases cost of doing business. And you know we import almost everything. And the importers, they don't care about, I mean, cost of finance because they know that when the goods arrive, they will be able to increase the price. Right. Since we are in they can easily sell what they, they import. Mm. So, if the hard things don't look good now, the only hope is that should the IMF program be successful, things could stabilize All right. and it could be light at the end of the tunnel. All right. Um, thank you so very much, Kweku uh, Enchi Buesia, a concerned Ghanaian citizen um, who is sharing his views. And if you have followed him on social media, he shares them profusely. Let's go to Bright Simmons now. And Bright Simmons has uh, a presentation to share with us. So I'll invite you to take your time listening to him and then share your questions, more particularly your views, with us whilst he's still on the show. Uh, Bright Simmons, thanks for your time. Good morning, Samson. I'm very gracious for, for the opportunity to uh, make a quick presentation as I was invited to do about debt restructuring in particular. Uh, I was asked to uh, provide a few comments about what Imani has been finding out um, it's likely to be the trajectory of these uh, proceedings as they proceed. We have to be, of course, careful uh, in establishing that the government has not officially um, confirmed these rumors of debt restructuring. Mm -hmm. But if you've been following the news, and particularly the international news, everybody is talking about debt restructuring. Yeah, they appear to be real, and we want to know what the implications will be. Indeed, sir. So I have a very few um, slides, well, not a lot, a few slides, a couple of slides that will try and work us through. First of all, we have to establish the policy context. The IMF, as most of us know now, um, do not traditionally give money to countries if the money is not going to make an impact. That is the theory. So that means, therefore, that if your debt is unsustainable, you are not likely to be able to pay your debt some um, uh, years down the line, a few years down the line. They will traditionally not give you the money. And so the policy is that they must only give you money uh, and admit you to a program if you have a credible policy to restore debt sustainability. Simply meaning, you must have some measures that are credible that will ensure that um, once the program is underway and soon thereafter, you'll be able to bring your debt back on the sustainability road. In order to assess this, they do something called uh, a sovereign risk and debt sustainability analysis. And in, in that mechanism, they are able to establish whether or not your situation is low risk, moderate risk, 
high risk or you're already in debt distress. So essentially, you are struggling to uh, make repayments as they okay. You know, Ghana has been in high risk for quite a while now. Um, so high risk means that they have some benchmarks for specific measures of your economy related to debt. And if you are not meeting those benchmarks or you are breaching the benchmark, depending on how you look at it, um, then you are traditionally considered to be in high risk of distress if those particular breaches are persistent or be persistent for a while. The other important point is that though they have these very clear benchmarks or thresholds, and I'll mention a few of them shortly, um, the people that are doing this are human beings and they exercise analytical judgment. They look at things particularly that are specific to your economy. And therefore, even though all the numbers may show that you are in debt distress, they have the means and they have the, um, the latitude to vary their, uh, uh, their analysis a little bit to accommodate what may be peculiar to your economy. Uh, in the past, when conducting these debt sustainability analysis, a particular factor called the country policy and institutional assessment was very important in deciding whether or not um, you have more capacity or less capacity than others to bear debts, because all of us have different, say, earning potential. So the kind of debts that may imperil you uh, may not imperil another person because they earn more money. So these institutional analysis tended to favor Ghana because Ghana was seen as a high-quality governance country for quite a while. Uh, two things have happened. One is that they've changed the overemphasis on this notion of institutional quality, etc. Um, and they, they, no, they're not changing the effort. They've reduced some of the emphasis. So it's, it's still factors, but other factors are also very important now. Secondly, Ghana has actually been dropping. Um, in 2012, thereabouts, we were second in Africa after Cape Verde, and we were consistently second for a number of years. More recently, Ghana has dropped to about seventh, and last year we dropped to, to eighth. And we are now beaten by countries like Uganda, Kenya, Senegal, Rwanda, um, even Benin has beaten us now. So because of those factors, the fact that we are no longer considered the most, one of the top two, three uh, most well-run countries in Africa, um, that will affect our debt carrying capacity and affect it a little, um, for which reason we are considered medium carrying capacities. So we are not low, we don't have very low ability to manage debt, and we are not high either. We are moderate. We are in the middle. The other factor that is also interesting and many people may not be aware is that we are also not classified as a resource-rich country. Ghana is classified uh, as a non-resource-rich country, which I'm sure will surprise a lot of Ghanaians, but that sometimes has an effect also uh, in some of the analysis. In simple terms, in order to determine how much debt you're able to carry, they look at overall strength of your economy and your money, the management of that economy, uh, and then they add other factors as, which are particular to the debt, how much you are borrowing, rate of debt accumulation, and things like that. Normally, they are looking at two main things, liquidity and solvency. But the, the, the difference is a bit academic. Liquidity mostly around the short-term ability to service the debt as a full due particular interest and amortization or principal repayment, paying back uh, what you borrowed. And then solvency is a bit more medium-term and it looks at um, the, the overall trajectory. When you do both, you come to an analysis, uh, analytical outcome, some kind of assessment position. Uh, and, you know, we did one in 2015 when we went to our, our last IMF program. And then because under the treaty that forms the IMF, every year they try and figure out what is going on in each country, something called the Article 4 consultations. When they come, sometimes they renew that debt um, analysis, that debt sustainability analysis. And I understand that Ghana has also done our own internal one in 2022, in June, though we've not published it. And I think you should have, you have to ask um, Mr. Klego in the studio when they will publish that so that those of us that, you know, pay attention to these things and ca can decide, you know, how things are faring. But the IMF one that they did in 2021, here are some of the results. And you can see that they were um, thinking that, you know, when it comes to our standard debt to GDP, by in this year, we'll be hovering around 40.9. Um, when it comes to how much of our um, money we'll be spending on paying our external debt, how much of our revenue as a country we'll be spending on paying our revenue, we're thinking of something in the region of um, 32% as the likely 
scenario. And then you have to remember that they have benchmarks. So when they look at these numbers, they look at what the benchmark should be between your status. In our case, remember that we are medium risk. The, the true fact is that, to be entirely honest, in 2015, when they did the debt sustainability analysis as part of the IMF program, bringing us in, they were too, um, shall I say, conservative or rather they were too optimistic in terms of how debt trajectory will go. And if you look at the top right uh, graph, you will see that they were expecting us to be spending maybe 30% of all the money that the government ends servicing our debt. And, and that has not been the case. Actually, less. We are spending around 25% or something. And today, we are on course to potentially spend 60% if things continue going the way they are in terms of interest rise, interest rates rising on the domestic market. And then, when they did it last time around, they had a baseline, which is like, you know, the more likely average kind of way things would turn out. And that one, too, you know, they were quite... Uh, optimistic you know they were looking around the 30 percent range and then they had some stress tests here is what we think will happen on average but if certain things happen um, that are unexpected and catastrophic what might change when you look at all those stress tests in simple terms you can see that some of the factors that you know they didn't take into account like the energy debt situation that you know they, they did not um, take into account some of the arrest issues that were at that time not completely clear all of those things has, have impacted the true situation, such that the projections they had in mind uh, have not borne out entirely uh, correctly. So what they said was, well, given uh, Ghana is very much on the borderline, that's what they said. They said we are on the borderline. Um, we are not. Our debt is not yet unsustainable, but if we don't take very radical measures, we will potentially spin, spill over. Some of the things that they talked about, like if we don't have market access and things like that, have already materialized now. They said, you know, some of the assumptions they are making that are better sustainable is based on continuing market access, which simply means that we can still borrow from the international markets, which we can't now. Um, and they had also talked about fiscal consolidation, cutting down how much we are spending and the like. And some of those activities have not been conducted in the way that will give you as much confidence as you'll expect. So in short, we did some depth sustainability analysis to determine whether or not we were sustainable. My personal view, looking at the benchmarks that normally, you know, they provide, the IMF themselves provide, and looking at the numbers that we have, and looking at the conditions they set then around market access and fiscal consolidation, that is cutting our expenditure significantly, which I don't think we've done since then. My assumption is that the debt is not sustainable. Of course, um, other people will, will disagree, and the IMF itself is here now to undertake a full-on analysis about where the situation is. But you can see some numbers on the table for those that are interested if you look at current GDP. Remember that because our uh, currency have depreciated and our GDP is measured in CD prices, so our, our GDP is falling slowly. If you take that, our standard debt, which is not falling very much because we are not repaying as much uh, aggressively as we, we could if we wanted to. So in that sense, the ratio is significantly in breach. And then you can look at other factors around the debt service as, as well. Though, of course, because we are also not borrowing a lot internationally, uh, most of the, the current pressure is domestically. 75% or more of the interest that the government pays is for domestic debt as opposed to international debt. And the, the IMF uh, analysis focuses a lot more on external, though because they look at the total as well, that captures the domestic. And when you look at the total, which captures the domestic, we have breached that threshold significantly. So that is an important uh, factor. What I, mean, what I mean is that how much of our total revenue we are using to pay debt versus what the IMF thinks uh, for a country that is of medium risk like us we should be spending. There's a significant um, a variation. Then you look at the fact that, okay, so we are now entering into this issue of debt restructuring. If I think our debt is unsustainable, then the IMF often has two or three, but two primary approaches they can take. They can argue that because your debt is not sustainable, you need to have a restructuring as part of your program before they can accept it. But don't forget, you have to come up with your program and then they negotiate with you and you sign an agreement, a memorandum of understanding. Now, sometimes they insist that unless your debt is uh, restructured, you have a debt treatment, as they call it, they cannot give you a program. So if that is the approach they take, then we have to restructure. They have, all, often have other uh, mechanisms also, something called lending into arrears, that allows them to still go ahead and give you money in the hope that you'll be able to um, readjust your fiscals so that your debt is now sustainable. Given Ghana's current situation, the amount of pressure on the fiscal regime, it's very, uh, it's very surprising to most analysts. The IMF said that, you know, they should do nothing about their debt um, as part of the program. 
but we'll see about that. Then the question becomes, okay, there are two main types of debt, of course. What you borrow from outside and what you borrow locally. What you borrow locally is what we call a domestic debt. Now, the question is, do we do both or do we do one or the other? Right. That's going to be one of the most important and fascinating debates to watch in the coming weeks. When you look at some analysis, some analysis about when you should do both versus when you should do one or the other, apart from one factor, all the factors in Ghana suggest you should do both. Apart from the factor around how much credit goes to the banks, um, give to the private sector, where in Ghana we are traditionally lower. So we are around about 14 or 15 percent, if I, my numbers are right. And in most places where they do both, the threshold tends to be around um, the um, uh, 55 uh, um, uh, percent threshold there about. But when you look at other factors like the overall public debt, you know, as a percentage of GDP, in our middle, medium risk situation, if you look at the domestic uh, public debt as a percentage, where we are almost half half domestic and external in terms of stock, and when you look at um, the, the the public debt that is due to private creditors, external private creditors, because we've moved far away from concessional and bilateral and multilateral, and more to private commercial players, because of all those factors, traditionally we should be doing both. That's if you, you are just being very objective, because of of the four benchmarks that usually comes to play when you want to make that decision, whether you do both or one or the other. Um, we meet three of them. But notwithstanding, when you are doing the external, typically it's more complicated. And it's more complicated for a very simple fact. One, some of the debt is due to governments, some of the debt is due to multilateral institutions. That I mean, for instance, as a policy that if you try to restructure multilateral debt by going to arrest. If you are you don't like old World Bank and you refuse to pay World Bank or African Development Bank refuse to pay them, they can't lend to you. And they have, they have they call it a no toleration policy. So usually externally you are more or less going to focus on the commercial debt. And there too we have the landing club for those that are you know commercial banks, the Paris club for uh, for those that are bilateral um, partners. In our situation where we are talking a lot more about the domestic we have a, a slightly, uh, not even slightly, significantly less complex situation to deal with. It's local law. All the partners are more or less lower than the sovereign in the sense that the government is in a better commerce bigger than everybody else that has lent money to the government. So the power dynamics are entirely in the government's favor, which is probably why people are speculating that they would prefer to do domestic than to do both or to do external. In that case, they have three main things they can do. They can reduce the maturity, sorry, they can lengthen the maturity. So if your thing was three months, if your 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 treasury bill was 180 which is six months or three months, they can say, well, now we'll pay you in a year or the coupon that we have to pay for your bond, if it is by annually, so we need to pay twice a year, we'll now pay you twice, uh, sorry, once every two years. They can, those, that, that's a second approach. One will be looking at the uh, how long before they pay you back, the rollover issue. The second may be looking at how much they pay you in intervals and how, how to extend that, or they can reduce that to amount, which is what, what some people call haircuts. So they can say that though they owe you 100 cities, now we owe you 70 cities. So in domestic type, just like international types, you have these main ways in which they can do the restructuring. The interesting thing though, so I had some banker friends tell me that, you know, domestic is almost unthinkable because some people are doing domestic. Actually, a lot of countries tend to do domestic, especially since um, the 2000s. Since the 2000s, predominantly, a lot of the restructurings um, have been domestic as opposed to external. And Africa is actually now one of the leading continents when it comes to countries doing the domestic um, um, restructuring. We've, been, we've overtaken Latin America, which for many years was the, was the leader. So there is a, a lot of precedents to learn from, uh, even in the, in the sub-region, if we want to do that. Let's also not forget that Ghana has, this is not the first time Ghana will be doing a restructuring. Uh, HIPIC was a restructuring, just that it was multilateral and it was focused. At that time, we didn't have a lot of private debt. Most of our money was owed to uh, countries, rich countries, often called bilaterals, or big organize, international organizations like the World Bank, uh, IMF, often called multilaterals. The other point is, normally when you're doing a domestic restructuring, because of the local law advantage that I mentioned, the fact that everything is happening within local law, if you do, you do an international transaction like a euro bond, uh, traditional people that are lending you the money will insist that you use English law or some other law where they, they are more confident in the courts, some other jurisdiction where they are more confident in the courts. When you borrow on, if the government borrows through treasury bills or bonds or whatever, it's local law, it's Ghanaian law. That often means, therefore, that, and I'll talk about this because it's the most important thing in the whole uh, um, delivery, 
The important thing is that it can happen much quicker. Though if you look at the, the graph that I put on the table, you can see that for about 30%, almost 30% of domestic restructurings, it's taking more than three years, right? So it's not for, it, it cannot take for granted that because uh, you know, 42% of all domestic restructuring happen less than six months around the world. If Ghana was also to do it, it would be less than six months. It could be more. And we have evidence also to suggest that um, it tends to be more bonds, which is the kind of uh, debt that you put on the you can put on the stock market and people can buy and sell, and um, that traditionally will will get restructured as opposed to bank loans. So the government sometimes has owes banks money directly as in, in form of credit, and then sometimes owes suppliers, road contractors, and things like that. And we'll come to that also in a second. The other point is, even though it can look simple, in practice, it can get very complicated depending on the sophistication of the investors. So if the, the let's say the banks in Ghana, who are some of the people that could potentially be affected, high expensive consultants, some of the negotiation tactics they can bring can make the final settlement very complicated. So if you look at the case of Greece, they, were, they used three main strategies to make it palatable to investors, including in one instance, using something called um, GD, uh, GDP warrants, meaning that they pay you only if their GDP goes above a certain level, etc. Uh, in some instances, they give new um, um, bonds to, they, they exchange the, the, the debt that you had. So let's say you had a certain uh, debt with them. They will take that debt from you, which was, let's say, 30% treasury bill, and it was three months. They'll say, no, now you have a one-year treasury note, and that one-year treasury note, uh, instead of 30%, is now uh, 20%. And instead of it being 100 cities, it's now 15 cities. So they did those kinds of exchanges, but they added a number of very interesting um, dynamics um, to it, including how they uh, added pledges. They did what we call credit enhancements. They added things that made it more interesting. Like, for instance, adding some guarantees from the European Union so that now the debt you are holding is a bit stronger than what you, you had before. But the GDP warrants one is very interesting because then it means that for some of the people that have hope in the reform, they, they make more money, Ghana gets better, and things like that. But a huge part of the analysis, um, and this is, at, at, I guess, at the heart of it, and most of the questions that I had with your team, so, sorry, most of the conversation I had with your team, I think, centered around those kind of issues. And that is basically who is lending government money in Ghana, and therefore whose debt is being restructured. It's not that simple as it looks, right? You've got banks. You've got the Bank of Ghana itself lends money to the government. And uh, you've got uh, funds, institutional funds, like pension funds, mutual funds, and things like that, rural banks and others. Now, how each of them will be impacted will be different. And therefore, another important analysis we have to do is look at that. I've already told you that there are people who owe, who uh, have lent to the government, but they've not let us through bought bonds or things like that, contractors, for instance. And most of the restructuring, I presume, will not pass those kind of debt, but we can never tell until we finalize. When you look at who is going to bear the brand, you can look at who holds the debt. The banks hold about 32 to 34 percent of the 190 billion or so domestic debt. They keep changing because we keep paying and we keep borrowing. And then you have institutional investors like the pension funds and the rest who, are, who hold about 26 percent. So of the money that we Ghanaians have lent to the government, more than a third have been lent to the government by the banks. More than a quarter have been lent to them by businesses and institutional investors like pension funds and the rest. Individuals like you and I, uh, only about 13%, and so on and so forth. Now, it, it will be very difficult for the government to say, I'm tackling one category as versus the other. Let's say I'm only going to restructure banks. But in a way, too, that would be simpler. If the government was only dealing with the commercial banks, why? Because there are a few of them, 24 or so, and you can put them all in a room, bring a Ghana Association of Bankers, and perhaps cut a deal. And also, they are more likely to be susceptible to political pressure versus households. Uh, the problem with the discrimination clauses and those kind of things that may come to play, and I'll mention that very quickly. Don't forget also that uh, the debt is not only in directly from Ghana government. It's, even though they are all government of Ghana liabilities, some of them have come through other channels. Like, for instance, the ESLA and the Dache um, are themselves companies that have been incorporated and then raise the debt, and the money goes to the government. But if you are doing a restructuring, it's between Dache uh, Trust and PLC and ESLA PLC and the bondholders, the people that have lent the debt to the government. It's not between the government of Ghana and those people directly, even though those liabilities are government of Ghana liabilities. And that will also feature in how you do the legals to figure that out. And there are a lot of you know, small-scale in uh, investors who will be hit if you decided to do it across the board as opposed to category by category 
etc. So about 1.4 million people apparently in Ghana uh, invest in government securities and other types of securities of that nature. The other thing is that some of the banks are more exposed than others. Some of the state-owned banks, for instance, have massive amount of their assets in uh, um, in treasury bills and bonds. Uh, and you have a situation also where because some of the banks have a significant amount of their income coming from um, the, the government side because of the, 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 the government security they hold, some of them will be hit very badly if you did this. Some banks will literally um, go overboard because of their current solvency pressure. You have a significant situation where some banks are making very limited amount of income from the loans that they've given out and making a lot of their income from the money that they pay to the government. So if the government decides to cut that amount significantly, their profit goes under because you just have to look at return on assets. So if you have a certain set of assets and one asset is the, 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 the securities, the money you've lent to the government, and another is the money you've lent to the private sector, and the private sector when you have a lot of non-performing loans and the return is low, but the one from the government consistently every month, uh, sorry, every uh, uh, period, repayment period, the government gives you your 30% coupon rate or whatever. And then all of a sudden we cut that amount. It affects your entire profitability. And given that uh, return on assets is not that high, it's less than 5% in Ghana, you could significantly see a lot of banks go under pressure. Then the government will have to find money to uh, enhance their liquidity again. So by the time you finish, it's not as simple as just you know doing a restructure and then saving money. In fact, some restructures cost more when you take the overall lifespan of the program versus um, what you started with. So solvency and liquidity will be a big problem for banks. Same with institutional investors for whom the investors, the investments in property are not yielding. A lot of the, um, the funds, the pension funds, their two biggest asset classes is property, that's real estate, all the nice fancy buildings you are seeing all around, and government securities. Now, the real estate area takes a long time to start generating money. The government one is very liquid. Imagine what happens when the government part is not paid. In short, you will have to do another asset quality review. We are actually overdue for another asset quality review. We know that the Bank of Ghana itself has admitted uh, it needs another $1 billion to go and fix our banking system again because despite all that they've done, uh, there's still a mess in some, in some quarters. What those of us who follow this closely will tell you is that it goes beyond the ones that we know like NTHC and the rest that are in the press. Some banks are having serious capital issues and liquidity issues. And before you touch any of those banks' assets in the way that, you know, it's uh, 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 despeculated, you better do an asset quality review and a major stress test and, and determine that. And of course, uh, as I've already mentioned, some of the insurance companies, some of the pension funds and the rest have significant allocation to government um, securities. And given that they have, you know, the, sometimes some of the, the requirement, the law itself, uh, uh, it favors them lending to the government. So if you look at the, the fund managers in Ghana, the rules allow them to lend up to 75% of their money to the government. And then every other category uh, or class of assets, like lending to the private sector or whatever it is, buying uh, debt from the private sector, is heavily capped. So we incentivize people for lending to the government. Can you imagine? And then when you come back and you have, you're under pressure, you say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to pay you. When we've told you all along that government is very low risk to put most of your money into government securities or lend most of your money into government, and we believe you, because you are the ones who issue these guidelines and say we should give the money to government. So those are very important factors that we need to bear. The other thing is also that the foreign investors are here. They are not gone entirely. They are now about 12.3% about of all the debts that the government has secured in the local market, the domestic market, uh, is due to the foreign uh, investors. They might be harder to ignore when it comes to the litigation risk, the, the, the possibility that some of these investors will refuse to accept and go to court. Now, the fact that some of the debt is also in dollars and, and the banks are the biggest holders of the debt in dollars, the domestic debt, I mean, and some of the foreign investors are the other big class of investors holding the dollar debt, means that we have to consider whether or not the, the risk factor only affects CD assets or dollar assets are also important. Mm. That's not my most important point. Mm. I personally believe that because of the fact that the collective action clauses, which is simply a way of saying that um, specific clauses in the contracts, when you lend to government, when you buy a treasury bill or you buy a bond, that contract you sign with the government implicitly, the collective action clauses that have not been tested properly because of our, our history. We've not really had some of these situations before in the way that they've turned out now. Though we've defaulted before in 82 and 79, when we did the currency demonetization, mm -hmm. it was regarded as a kind of default. But we've not had the situation like we're currently confronted with. 
So the law, the law governing the contracts, these, these debt contracts are themselves not well developed. Mm. That means, therefore, that if somebody takes the government to court, the likelihood that the uncertainty around it may make the whole process uh, less palatable to international investors and rating, rating agents and the like is very high. So the simple thing is to pass a new law like Greece did. Greece passed the law and it applied retrospectively okay. and said that when you give a loan to the government, the government can change the terms and uh, when the economic situation warrants it. I hope so you can get to the final slide. We can get to the final slide in the next two, two minutes. minutes. Mm. Yes. Now, the issue is that if you decide then to go to parliament and pass a law, you cannot do that unless the opposition party are on board. So the issues around whether or not you can do a deal across all the categories of assets, which is called aggregation, whether you can use voting or it has to be quorum, and all those matters, if they are not in the actual contracts you sign with people, you need to go to parliament and do a law. And if you go to parliament and do a law, it's a very strong sense, I get, that the opposition party will litigate all the matters again on the political realm by asking you, why are you doing only for domestic? Why should only Ghanaians suffer when the time came and we were all enjoying the foreign investors were also enjoying. There will be issues to do with, you know, how much of a loss and a hit it will, it will affect, you know, different people in the country, different communities and things like that. And all the other impacts. But of course, the opposition will also have to take into account the, in their mind, the political gains they stand to make. If the usual things that happen with debt restructuring, which is that you see GDP fall, which is that sometimes you have a higher stress, they mean therefore that they stand a better chance at the next election and the rest of it. But even outside the short-term, uh, some will say short-sighted political gains that the position will be looking at, is the fact that it, indeed, analysts will tell you that when you, come, you do both external and internal, uh, internal debt or domestic debt, you tend to see a better recovery overall than if you just did uh, the domestic. So those factors will be hit critical. My last point is that above everything else is whether people believe that any of these restructuring things will make a big difference. If people don't believe that, nothing will change. Because we know, for instance, that when it comes to public financial management reforms in this country, only 34% of the last strategic plan, which ended in 2018, were fulfilled. You've already mentioned in your preliminary remarks, Samson, that 88% of transactions in the financial statements of the controller and accountant general does not appear in the existing store, which is the main accounting system. That's completely mind-boggling. We also know that we are seeing significant slippages in the fiscal regime when we say we're going to cut spending. We are actually increasing spending significantly. When we say we are going to reduce how much we are borrowing, we, are, we have increased domestic borrowing by 480% as of the last budget. And we have problems with it. Like, um, the GMPC deciding, uh, going to the PURC and telling the PURC that got the gas that is used to produce power, on average, costs us $7.9. Then the same GMPC will turn around and cut a deal that sells the gas to a private company for $1.72. These things create massive, some of them in the energy sector, that are not all evident and all clear. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore, there's a belief that all of this restructuring will be for nothing. Then I can see the political economic environment not allowing the government to proceed easily. Thank you. And sorry for going over my time allocation. Thank you very much. Uh, that's been Bright Simmons making his presentation on the potential, almost unavoidable debt structuring that Ghana has to go through and the implications of the debt structuring. I suppose you pay attention to the very final, I mean, the last two minutes of that presentation, um, revealing, isn't it? 88% of what we do, we have a centralized, you know, accounting system through which the, the funds must go through in our procurement. 88% doesn't go through it. So you can control, you can check. Um, entities and ministries are spending far beyond their budgets. And a lot of things that are tagged as uh, presidential initiatives, so to speak, are presently not being audited by the Auditor General, so you haven't really seen much uh, to be, be talking about. The um, Reuters, in their report, suggest that, you know, Bryce Simmons mentioned whether to do only domestic or uh, external debt restructuring or both. And doing the domestic uh, restructuring, the writer says that there's a real possibility uh, for Ghana in any kind of domestic debt restructuring 
could severely threaten the local banking sector. And that's from uh, a senior director uh, of the ratings agency, Fitch. And as you know, yesterday in the afternoon, they further downgraded Ghana from the CCC, whatever plus, to uh, CC, further junk status. What are the implications of all of this for you and I, for our economy? We're taking a quick break. When we return, uh, we have Dr. Theo Echampong, we have Professor Bokwing, and we have Samson Aklego right here in the studio. Close the window small. Ah, your room be too bright, oh. Why, you be vampire where you know the light sunlight. Oh, my guy, my eyes, oh, my eyes. Behind the PC problem. Oh, in the sun problem. Come on, light bulb, sir. This no matter. Eh? I bear go Robert and Sons. Mm. Oh, yeah. Then my chick to him, I know correct. Cra. Where Robert and Sons sort them out sharp. Now, so, so stylish frames in the wrong. <laughs> we go go Robert and Sons right here. No, I was sitting inside proper. For over 25 years, Robert and Sons continues to provide specialist eye care for both adults and children. Locate us at Adabaka, Adenta, Kumasi, Usudangwa, Tema, Weja, and East Legon. Call 050-151-9111. Robert and Sons, seeing is believing. The National Petroleum Authority, in collaboration with the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors and under the auspices of the Ministry of Energy and African Refiners and Distributors Association, is organizing the Ghana International Petroleum Conference, GIPCON 2022, live at the Kempinski Hotel, Goko Security, Accra, from the 28th to the 30th of September 2022. This year's conference is under the theme energy transition in the African petroleum downstream context, prospects, challenges, and the way forward. The special guest of honor for the event is His Excellency Ahaji Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, with Honorable Minister for Energy Dr. Matthew Pukupempe also delivering an address. The conference is designed to actively bring to the fore the downstream petroleum industry's perspective and guidance on issues of governmental policy and regulatory framework. GIPCON 2022 will witness a convergence of regulators and downstream industry stakeholders from across the West African sub-region and beyond. It is a unique occasion to connect with many specialists in the downstream petroleum industry from all over the world. For registration, participation, opportunities for exhibition and sponsorship, kindly visit gipcon.com. Hi, my name is Nanama McBrown, and I want to encourage you to dial star 165 hash on MTN to join the My Way family. My Way provides you and a selected family member a cover against death. As a policyholder, you will also have a cover against total permanent disability and hospitalization should you be hospitalized for more than two nights. Dial star 165 hash and join the family. Send you my way. Cause no way. My way is a product of my life and empty and momo. Terms and conditions apply. Image Brew and April Communications, in partnership with the National Theatre, presents... Stanley, look, all hell will be let loose if now we're to see anything in the newspapers about me and Mary and living in Laboni. Ah, but why? Because I live with Nash me in his cantonments. No, son. You live with Mary in Laboni. Daddy. Hey, you've got two homes. Yes. One here with Mary. Yes. And one with your girlfriend in his cantonments. Uh, yes, only Nash is not my girlfriend. What is she? A German shepherd. She's my wife. Hey, run for your wife. I am a I am a Live at the National Theatre, Saturday 1st and Sunday 2nd October, 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. each day. Tickets are now selling for 100 Ghana cities at Bachona Total, Koala, Frankie's, Tama Community 11 Shell, Nalem Store, X-Men, East Legon, or go to www.imagebureaugh.com or dial star 365 star 2020 hash. So you've got two wives? Yes. And two homes? Uh, yes. I can't believe it. Me, myself, sometimes I'm surprised. We can. For the most hilarious comedy of your life. Including 
a trip to Qatar and fuel vouchers. You could even walk away with a grand prize of 250,000 Ghana CDs in cash. A cost to a betway. Enter today at betway.com.gh. This advert has been approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Bet responsibly. Hubtel presents Fresh Anguamo with all the great delights. Fufu in a flash with Koto, Yemadie, and Akrantie. Almighty Gobe with Koko and eggs. Ish. Crispy fried chicken with rice, pizzas, and whatever else you're looking for or need to pay for. Hubtel presents Ghana's most useful app. Hubtel is everything you. Welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. This is brought to you by Bank of Africa, MTN, Star Assurance, HS University, Robert and Sons, Optical Services, Fenard Ghana, Duraplus, St. Thomas Eye Hospital, Hoptel, and Miwe Insurance. Now, a while ago, you just had uh, Bright Simmons, who uh, spent um, close to 30 minutes taking us through. Uh, what the restructuring, the nitty-gritty of what restructuring looks like, particularly for our context and the potential implications. Um, right. We have uh, Professor, God, uh, Professor Godfred Bokwing, who is economist, University of Ghana Business School, Dr. Theory Champong, who is economist and political science, uh, political risk analyst, and also here in the studio, we have Samson Akligo, who is Director of Financial Sector, uh, Ministry of Finance. Now, let's go to Dr. Theo Champong. Yes, so, Doc, um, we, we are just trying to appreciate what this is, um, the potential restructuring, the questions of debt default, and what it means for all of us as ordinary citizens. And of course, your views are also important to help, you know, uh, public policy if uh, the government listens. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you and uh, good morning. And also it's a pleasure uh, to, to be here. Um, like, you know, Kweku spoke earlier on, um, I am also quite worried. And in fact, I have been worried for a while now. Um, Yesterday, I had three of my friends in, in Ghana actually call me. Um, and these are people who have savings uh, within the banking sector, but also have bought um, treasury bills and, and, and related instruments. And uh, they had read the, the news uh, through the grapevine um, and some of the articles. And basically, we're, we're wondering, you know, um, Theo, am I going to get my money back uh, from, from the government? And even if I would get it back, uh, would that be at a significant discount or haircut as is being um, pontificated uh, within, the, within the news um, uh, wires? Yes, um, Doc, so, Dr. Champo, there are, there are many, many people who are in the circumstance of your friends. And I can say I'm one of them, and I'm seeking to benefit from your advice this morning. So absolutely. So in a sense, I've become a, a financial advisor. I know <laughs> that is not exactly... My job, but the point the point is the exposure of the of the government um, and the heavy exposure. So we know that typically, as Bright said, government borrows right to finance its spending plans or allocations. You either go and borrow from the external market, or you borrow uh, from the local market or the domestic market. Um, I was just looking at some of the latest numbers from the Bank of Ghana. And the, the total debt as we had as of June 
was just about $54 billion or 396, 393 billion Ghana cities, roughly 78% of our GDP. If you break those things down into the external and the domestic, 28 billion of that 54 billion, so roughly 203 billion Ghana CD is external debt, and then another 190 or so billion is domestic debt. So that's another 26 billion. So if we're going to restructure your debt as part of uh, any IMF program, or sometimes even the preconditions that need to be met for accessing the financing, the important question then becomes, do you restructure just the external debt component of it, the 28 billion, or do you restructure the 26 billion, or do you actually do right both of them? And if you did both of them, where or who should shoulder the burden of those uh, of those cuts? And then it comes down into really understanding who owes what uh, uh, in terms of what you know the the government um, exposure overall is. I think that yes, there is some room for renegotiation of both the external and the domestic debt, but with a big caveat. And the caveat really comes down to the unintended consequences, especially when you attempt to restructure or renegotiate the, the domestic debt component. I think it's far more easier, in my view, uh, to uh, sit down with your external creditors. It might take a little bit longer time, as we've seen with, with Zambia uh, most recently, but the exposure of that to your domestic economy would be far lesser than if you actually attempted to go the domestic debt restructuring route, particularly because if you look at our domestic debt uh, composition, and Bright was talking about this um, just a few moments ago, but in terms of our domestic debt, right, the, the total exposure, the, the banking sector in Ghana alone uh, holds about 50% of the total exposure of that debt. So if you take the banking sector and you break it down, Bank of Ghana from 2021, and these numbers I'm quoting is coming from the annual public debt statistics published by the Ministry of Finance. The Bank of Ghana uh, exposure is 19.8 uh, or roughly 20%. And then the commercial banks have another 30 percent exposure and then you also have individual investors or institutional investors uh, comprising the non-bank sector also having uh, an exposure of about 33 right percent each so if you attempted to restructure the domestic debt particularly what we are hearing now with the idea of you know uh, people taking a haircut or suffering losses in an already strained financial sector where we're seeing the asset quality of some of those banks. And remember that in, in Ghana, many of our commercial banks actually are not necessarily lending to the private sector. Most of those monies are being lent to the government. And if the government then decides that we're not going to be honoring some of those payment obligations, two things likely could happen. You might end up like my friends, now thinking on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, going to take out all of the money that they currently have, right, within the, the banking uh, setup and what they have invested in treasury bills and things like that. And that could have a, a serious repercussion in terms of potentially even a run, right, on the, on the banks. Um, and you could also then subsequently have an effect of that with the banks themselves in terms of their solvency and liquidity and some of the other you know um, indicators that that we look at so on, on on the surface restructuring the domestic debt yes sounds nice but i would argue that there are far 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 bigger unintended policy consequences that we could you know suffer as a result if we're not too careful about it and um i use my friends as the example here where they are thinking or some people are thinking of actually pulling out those investments and that could then even have a much more dire consequence uh, on the uh, on the economic recovery i think for the uh, the external debt 
we do have some leverage or some room to engage uh, those um, creditors, uh, particularly those who hold the, the euro bonds. Um, if you take the external debt, and again, you break that down, um, of that 28, 29 billion, uh, about 57% of that is money that we owe to uh, international um, commercial creditors. So these are predominantly euro bonds. And then we have another 30% of that owed to multilateral. So your IMFs, the World Bank, African Development Bank, um, and then some smaller numbers to bilaterals. I think we can sit down with the multilaterals um, and also with the ex external creditors uh, to go under the G20 um, debt restructuring framework uh, to buy us some time uh, to reprofile or extend the tenor and the duration of some of those external debt. I think that is possible, but it will be quite dangerous in my view uh, to attempt the um, domestic debt restructuring if we are not too careful and purely because of the potential unintended consequences of that action, giving the heavy, heavy exposure of a lot of our banking setup to, uh, you know, government uh, securities. That's a, a real concern about um, a run on the financial institutions, uh, particularly if uh, domestic restructuring will not happen without, you know, as is being suggested. And if you read international wires, as is being suggested, people taking a haircut. Um, and when you say in, in, in finance, a haircut, please, in plain, um, ordinary man's language, what exactly do you mean? I'm going to get less than what I have put in? Yeah, no, so for example, let's say you give the government uh, 100,000 Ghana cities, right? So you bought T-bills, 100,000. Um, and let's say we say we're giving or uh, taking a 20% haircut or discount on that. It basically means that you're going to get 80,000 or so back. That's what that means. So the original amount that you invested, you're not going to get that same amount back. And you would have had a contractual relationship between you and your bank to actually invest those, you know, uh, monies for you. The interesting bit which um, uh, Bright makes reference to is to what extent can the institutional investors and people like my friend actually trigger certain clauses that they have in those uh, uh, agreements that they have to force the government to more or less honor those obligations. I don't know. But there, there are three things that you could do. You can give the, the discount or the haircut or you can restructure the debt by extending the um, the maturity profile and the duration uh, all uh, at the same time. All those things will be on the table. But what we are reading and what I've also picked up from the, the grapevine and through the news wires is the attempt to go more towards um, a, a, a discount or a haircut, which could have some really dire consequences for uh, a, a number of, of our banks and ultimately, people also losing the value of some of those investments that they have made within the... the people have already lost the value of their, their money already. I mean, because of the behavior of the city, it's, it's, uh, it's a very difficult situation. Um, if you have some small money in dollars and you're beginning to look at what it, the implications are in cities, um, you can tell that it's really, really very terrible. Now, uh, Professor Bokwing... Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, I've heard you say that the solution to our crisis is beyond the IMF, uh, not this IMF thing that we are looking at. How so? All right. Good, good morning, Samson. Good morning to our cherished listeners and viewers, and good morning to my co-panelists. Um, it's always exciting uh, listening to Bry Simons. Um, I am tempted to think that um, you did economics maybe without knowing, and um, <laughs> maybe you should join us in academia. Yeah. Uh, we would love to have you on our team. Okay. Thank you also uh, to you. A good yeah. invitation to Bright Simmons there. Um, there are people yes. who are already saying that we are having a, a master class um, on the show this morning with all of you guys. Yes. Our hope is that, yes. it's, it, that it does not remain, you know, academics and pure economic Something. masterclass. But 
that the duty bearers we, we are listening and will, you know, take good advice. Yes. Something. We have never been academic. We have never been theoretical. Look, if you check all that we have said from last year to date, you see there wasn't any theory. In fact, when people even say we have been theory, the theory gives us that grounding. Okay, and that predictive framework. We derive that from the theory. Please. We are in this because government failed to listen. We are in this because of the posture of government. We are in this because of our own actions and inactions. So we could not outsource everything to Russia, Ukraine. But something, this is where I come in. An IMF program is an economic program, largely. For Ghana to comprehensively, sustainably come out of this situation, we need certain governance reforms, which will require revisions to our constitution, power that with some productivity enhancing reforms. Other than that, an IMF program is inadequate. It could give us some temporary pain relief but it will soon come back. Because once you don't solve the underlying issues, and I'm sure many of the things Bryce Simon have told us this morning in his presentation are not things, all of them cannot be taken on board an IMF program in solving. So if you look at the causes, you can see that there are some that you need other interventions to address. And we could not look to the IMF solely to address all of that. That is where I'm coming from, okay? It is not within the powers of the IMF to tell our government, reduce the size of your ministers or your government. No. No. And certain specific reforms that we need to do, productivity enhancing reforms that must be bundled together, because reforms are more effective, they are bundled together or reinforce each other. We cannot look to the IMF to, to do that for us. The best helping hand Ghana can find is at the end of our own arm. If we fail to look at the situation the way it is and prefer the right solutions, I don't think that uh, an IMF program is, is the solution. But let me just acknowledge all that has been said by... You know, when I listened to uh, is it Mr. Kweku and Tribu Siakun, right? I, I, I thought that I had been a bit more harsh, but when I listened to him, I realized that, oh, I've been very moderate. But actually, he, he said it all. He captured, this, he captured it very well. Look, and something I can tell you, the harder you look at the data, the more troubling it becomes. The more troubling it becomes. And my worry, and I've said this time and again, that it doesn't seem the government is of the same level in terms of what the data is communicating, in terms of the direction where we are heading towards. And that is a bit concerning for me. Now, already, even without restructuring, a lot of financial institutions are going to post negative real returns. Headline inflation is approximately 34%. And we are told that inflation hasn't peaked yet. So this is the environment, the control environment within which you want to do domestic debt restructuring, where the real return is already negative. OK. Okay, so it's just like asking somebody to take a haircut when actually there's no hair on his head. Okay, it's, it's going to get a bit more harder, right? So, and then the other thing is that if you look at the objective, I just want to add this to what my good friend Dr. Tio mentioned. If you look at the objective of the debt restructuring, which is not only the principal maturity repro uh, profiling and also the interest cost, the bulk of the interest cost today is driven by the domestic debt. And that is why perhaps it's very difficult to focus solely on the external debt if you want to reduce the interest cost, which is already taking more than 60% of non-oil tax revenue, right? That is not sustainable. And Bryce Simmons has already told us that if you look at that alone as a measure of liquidity, it's way above the policy dependency threshold, right? So you are looking at what kind of restructuring you have to do that brings a lot of those indicators 
perhaps closer to the policy dependency threshold or below for some of them below the policy dependency threshold so perhaps where we find ourselves we, we it's, it's, it's very hard and it's very difficult for in the imf to get out the government to come and tell us oh we can do this deal without debt restructuring then you know the program can only achieve limited effectiveness that, that that's that's the whole thing um the other thing is to look at the moral side oh you could see the 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 issue about this you know uh, haircuts or people losing the value of their investment which or the interest they could get from the yes, investment w which mm -hmm. you know is what has the potential to cause a run on our financial institutions which we have to be very careful about extremely careful about um is it not the case that this already is standard is is normal it happens and people are actually experiencing it across the globe. People in Ghana right now who have certain investments are already, you know, suffering this. So what's new about it? Well, the, the magnitude and the scale varies. Just as we are saying that inflation is rising all over the world, it's, 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 it's more depressing in other countries than other countries. So, for instance, Europe may be complaining, well, you know, inflation average is 9.4% or a little above 10%, right? But in Ghana, we are talking about um, uh, approximately 34%, right? So the magnitude differs, and therefore some people may be suffering more than the others. Then again, you are looking at income levels, right? Our income levels are very low. So when inflation is um, uh, 34%, it, it impacts us much more, and then you're also looking at the necessary cushioning environment from the policy, fiscal policy side. Those countries are doing some kind of um, support. In fact, uh, Spain had to impose some taxes on energy companies, and they raised in excess of 7 billion euros, which they are going to use to subsidize their citizens. But it, whilst other countries are doing that, even capping energy prices and the rest of that, the pass-through here is very direct. On top of that, the government has forced e levy down our throats, right? And and we have to swallow that with with with, with more uh, uh, pain mm. and all of that. But the other side we need to look at is whether the government has demonstrated enough good faith to show up at the restructuring table, right? And whether the government will be able to come to that restructuring table with clean hands. The reason I say so is that we have said time and again that the size of government is unproductive. Mm. The government must take its fair share of the haircut to come to the restructuring table in order to get positive response from the investor community. That is very important. And the government should not take that for granted. If the government is not taking any haircut, you have no incentive to ask me to take a haircut. When you are growing your hair as long as you want, you want it, so that is very important. And that is why you realize that for companies, in the confirms, when they are doing restructuring, they look within. Before you approach the bank with a distress loan situation, you look within and demonstrate that I myself have taken internal austerity. This is what I've done. Okay? So if you fail to do that, you could not come to the restructuring table with any moral standing. It means that you are not showing leadership. It means that you are not prepared to show leadership that is already biting me, and this is how much haircut I have taken. And mm. I put that on the table, and mm. I said, get along. You, you, your, your view is that uh, the haircut, so to speak, that government appointees have taken is insufficient? No, 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 not, not at all. Not at all. And that is why we are saying that if we don't do the necessary governance reforms, and you think that you can have that number of ministers and, 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 and the whole cost structure around that, then an IMF program is in inadequate. It's just a matter of time, and it will show up again. So let's do the needful now. Let's ask ourselves realistically. There's an argument, there's argument that you really don't save much if you uh, collapse ministries and ministers uh, from as bloated as it is to about 50 or so. You don't save much. Yeah, something. We are not saying you should save the entire economy in a week. The signal effect... You have no idea what it will bring. Otherwise, why are we going to the IMF if it's all about just getting $3 billion? After all, we lose that through corruption annually. 
Ghana through corruption loses more than three billion dollars annually. Why are we going to the IMF for just three hundred billion, uh, three billion dollars to be spread over three years or so, which will come in tranches? So is the signal effect and the hope and the confidence it generates in getting everybody along? That is very important. Look, since independence, our biggest problem has been leadership deficits, okay, and which manifests in various forms, corruption and the rest of them. Otherwise, we won't be here. And if you check, and something, you, you look at this. Since the last time the, uh, the rating agency downgraded Ghana, particularly from Fitch, except the monetary side, the fiscal side has been quiet. There has not been any step whatsoever practicable, predictable, that the government has communicated to the market about how they are dealing with their situation. And that is time we have to go into a deeper junk territory. Look, if you, where we are right now, it will not take us less than five, six years to come out of that. The government security is the most safest in the event of frictions, restrictions, challenges, people turn to government securities as a safe haven. If that itself is now becoming unsafe, where are we heading towards, Samson? Where are we heading towards? Mm. These are the issues. Um, Dr. Theo Champong, uh, you, 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 are, you are in the UK. Um, I have been wondering, reading uh, in the newspapers there, for example, the Daily Mail, you know, uh, this week, its publication, it says, Chancellor vows new era for Britain as he unveils a massive package of measures to turbocharge growth. Biggest tax cuts for 30 years. Tax holidays. Um, you read most of the, you know, papers, and they are talking about tax cut, tax bonanza, tax cut bonanza in bid to stop the economic rot, according to the, the Times, um, the Mirror, all of them, the Financial Times, all of them, they, they are happy about this. Um, what, what's, I don't get it. How does it work that they are in, you know, prob, they're in a problem as far as, you know, inflation is also concerned, and yet their solution is the biggest tax cut ever? Yeah, so there are tax cuts uh, that have been announced uh, since yesterday, but uh, I must put on record that not everybody is happy about it because you can see the, the reaction of that uh, from the market where the pound uh, took a heavy uh, beating um, yesterday and the last couple of days. Um, and the idea really is that, uh, or this is anchored in economics, what they call uh, the supply side, right? So basically, if you cut taxes and things like that, then that will stimulate growth and productivity and investment and eventually it creates jobs and, and things like that. But that is still highly debated, I must uh, say, even within the literature, whether or not such uh, supply side, um, uh, uh, you may call, um, you know, uh, Milton Friedman type ideas uh, would generally tends to work, how they work and how effective they tend to be. But that's the policy priority of the, the current government, which believes strongly in this supply side uh, economics, although some will say it's, it's been discredited uh, to an extent as not you know, fully working. But the jury is still out. We're still yet to see. The, the key thing is that despite the UK government borrowing um, and the UK government also having to even um, go to the market to, to borrow heavily to, to finance its budget and things like that. It's all about market sentiments and to what extent they believe one country or the other is able to meet those you know um, uh, priorities that they've set for themselves mm. and whether they can keep those spending levels uh, within, within checks. And that's when it comes to Ghana, a number of us, again, remain quite concerned or worried because, uh, like Prof was saying, for me, since the July IMF program was announced, right, um, we have the signaling that the government has sent to the market has been quite confusing. I, I say this because we're still yet to see even the details of the so-called homegrown policy. It's been mentioned, it's been talked about, but what you know, form, shape it will take, or even sort of the broad headlines, none of that has been 
uh, communicated. Number okay. two, um, the um, within that homegrown policy, the element of your debt sustainability analysis, the restructuring, all of those things, again, is still missing. So what is left really is now a lot of um, speculation taking place within the market as to what will happen, when it will happen, how it will happen, and, and all those things ultimately don't help because mm. then it has a consequential effect on even things like your um, uh, exchange rate. So okay. I think things that the government must do right. quickly. One, I would urge the Ministry of Finance and the government to put a statement out as soon as is possible, maybe tomorrow, maybe on Monday, more or less to allay fears, right, uh, of especially those who hold um, or have invested in government securities that, yes, they are working something out, but nobody would be maybe left, you know, had done by it. That would go a long way. And, 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 Some, and, Doc, needs to and Doc, that's actually real because we, we are people who are very concerned about this area. And we hear that some people are already, you know, um, taking their own measures because they don't want to be caught in this situation. Uh, somebody, yeah. for example, asked the question, um, in restructuring, why should ordinary citizens suffer by having their bond, uh, bonds principal cut? Would we have been better off buying dollars? And that's what I'm referring to. Would we have been better off buying dollars? Check what is going on uh, in the country. Why should I ever keep my savings in CDs? If you are in debt, you should sell your assets to pay. Why can't government sell uh, assets to pay debt? Why should I be penalized for saving my hard-earned income? Okay, so quickly to your next list uh, of uh, to-do. Actually, pick, um, following from what you just said, uh, the, the idea that we need to have a national forum, right, uh, a multi-stakeholder forum to bring everyone around the table on what uh, needs to be done. Uh, the size of the problem and where we find ourselves, I don't think requires just government sitting in some corner somewhere to, you know, uh, propose solutions. If anything, some of the solutions that they propose haven't even worked. That's why we are where we are now. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we need to have some uh, broader consultations and, and have a national forum on Ghana's sort of uh, economic recovery and what needs to be done okay. and have Let's... both opposition and other stakeholders around the table to prefer uh, solutions. Right. Let, to... me, let me come to uh, Samson Akligo in the studio. And uh, he graciously agreed to a plan where he's able to hear all of you and then we'll be able to give uh, some reactions or uh, some explanation to some of the issues if they are mis as it were understood or need further clarity. I'll share a few comments with you before. And uh, Manche Bruce uh, in Takradi says, the narrative so far has been heartbreaking. I guess it is now more pertinent for the president to cut down the size of government and on wastage. It will take more than IMF to change our narrative. Yes, Professor Bokwe has been saying this for all this while. Restoring and maintaining Ghana's fiscal health will require not just sound arguments and an engaged public, but something more. It will require an electoral system that encourages our representatives to place the long-term interests of public, of the public ahead of parochial, uh, personal, or special interests. Kofi Bento uh, from Imani. He says, the IMF cannot save Ghana. They can only prevent us from total collapse and becoming another Sri Lanka. Touch wood that we get to Sri Lanka. The more, you know, I am optimistic, the more the people keep telling me that. Stop being that optimistic because it looks like you're already there. Um, Sri Lanka, you can't even get fuel to buy. They are rationing it and looking even emergency services, having difficulty. We don't ever want to get there. He says, what we need for a durable solution is constitutional review to restructure our governance accountability system and rein in the excessive power of the executive to borrow and spend recklessly. You know, there's been the argument that this finance minister, all he has known, has been just to go to the euro bond. 
nothing nothing more um per our current system only parliament can stop them but parliament is weak and also because ministers are picked from there the ultimate solution is in constitutional reform that's the source of uh the problem and the place to start the correction and uh, the majority leader Osei chairman Sabozo, definitely agrees with Kofi Bento on this Manche Bruce also speaks about restructuring constitutional reform constitutional reform has been a major topic in this year, starting with the Fix the Country. That says we need to overhaul this uh, document of uh, advice to become a very important, you know, thing. So, first, I see you have written quite a lot. So, I give you the room to take the issues that have been mentioned, um, that have been flagged, that you want to speak to. Thank right. You. Thank you very much, Samson. I, I mean, <coughs> the namesake confuses me. When yeah. Prof and Co says something, yes. I, I realize that. <laughs> I, was, I realize that. Yeah, yeah. 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 but mm -hmm. I, I think I, I honestly uh, share. Except that there's um, P in your Samson. My yes. Samson has no P. <laughs> That's the <a> difference. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So Samson, I honestly share um, in the sentiments that has been expressed by the. Um, uh, by almost uh, starting from Kweku to to Bryce Simmons and um, and 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 also finally, uh, I think Professor Bobin and Tio. Uh, you know the, the real uh, the first thing that I think uh, is important for me to do is to situate the conversation within the current domestic uh, context. So one, it is true that we are in a very difficult period. In terms of the macroeconomy, uh, we can't um, you know, we can pretend about that. If you see the what is happening in terms of inflation, in terms of the exchange rate depreciation, uh, you know, the, a lot of real incomes have been have been eroded. And uh, if you also see the trajectory of economic policy, what um, the Ministry of Finance, supporting the broader government, uh, have been trying to do, especially 20, uh, since 2020. Uh, has been a lot of uh, effort to see how they can contain the fallout uh, that happened when the fiscal part was derailed, especially in 2019. Uh, but fast forward, uh, what is important now is that um, the gains that have been made, especially in 2017, 2018, and 2019, uh, have diminished. And we are in a very difficult uh, situation. There's actually an argument that um, it's, it's not correct for the government to be saying we built a strong economy, it was COVID and this thing that came in. Because what they say is that if you had built a resilient economy, it would have withstood, you know, the shocks that have come from external, you know, situations. Why is it that it couldn't withstand them? And other countries, they, we compare, even within the sub-region, appear to have done better than we are and uh, so our city I, becoming the worst. Yeah, I don't... Um, well, I think um, I would approach this conversation in, in two ways. I mean, one, when you look at the, the fundamentals of the economy, I, I have no doubt that there's a lot of work that we need to do. The, the, in managing the economy, especially when you're talking about macro stability, and you are also looking at the structural reforms. Uh, they must go hand in hand, but sometimes on a day-to-day basis, the focus first is usually on what do you do to keep the economy stable, and then you, you move along. So in terms of the gains that I mentioned, uh, the focus really is on what we have seen in trying to stabilize the economy, especially between 2017, 18, and 19. And in, by 2020, those, we could see that those efforts actually derailed. And uh, as professionals, most of us know uh, the things that led to that, that derailing. But fast forward, where we are now is that, you know, we have decided uh, to go for an IMF program as a result of the confluence of, mm. uh, of many factors. And by virtue of going to the IMF program, uh, certain decisions need to be taken. Uh, um, and in the submissions... I think all those uh, submissions have been done in, in a broader way, but I will try and uh, simplify it in, in, two, in two ways. So uh, one of the key things that we need to do is that we need to do some difficult macro adjustments. 
those macro adjustments will come especially from expenditure. Uh, they would come from revenue, and they may also come from debt. Because when you are going to an IMF program, one of the key requirements is that your debt sustainability uh, framework, you know, must be something that the fund uh, supports. So you will see that as we are going to next week, we're going to start an official conversation with the IMF on, on this debt sustainability framework. Uh, the Ministry of Finance, together with Bank of Ghana and the government, have done a lot of uh, work so that we will be prepared. It's, it's more like a negotiation. So, for example, we, we, on our part, have to do a lot of work on our debt sustainability analysis and uh, actually come out with the certain internal parameters that we'll discuss with the IMF. So what we decide with the IMF or what the agreement that the IMF decides with us is what will inform what we are going to do with whether it's going to be a debt, a debt restructuring or what form of uh, debt restructuring that we should we should be we should be doing. Mm. So in essence, the Bloomberg reported that yeah. uh, the headline was that Ghana said to start debt restructuring for local bonds. Yes. So, but you know, uh, I mean, um, respectfully, I mean, as Bloomberg, they have to, you know, they are working as um, financial journalists. But yet officially, uh, what informs that decision would have to be an agreement on the DSA with the IMF. And then from there, uh, the government will then have to take steps as to what we need to do. Mm. But fundamentally, we, there, any there's no there's no position or clarity yet as to whether, like Bryce Simmons and everybody else has mentioned, is going to be just looking at domestic or external debt or both. No, 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 no. That actually that will happen next week. Okay. Yes, because the whole this whole conversation fundamentally is happening within the IMF. Framework. And as I said, the IMF will engage the country on our debt sustainability framework. But what are our options, really? Our options mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of what to what the restructure will restructuring will involve. No, so by I think uh, to re to actually assure the market, I think that one of the key options that the, the the ministry is considering is that we cannot even start this conversation without an extensive engagement with uh, with, with the market both domestic and external. And I think that any approach that is taken must be an approach that is industry-led. So I think that the, the final outcome will be a lot of iterations. It's not something that would be maybe government imposing, like maybe uh, this particular... No, but, but you go to the IMF with some strategy, at least with uh, some plan. No, so, so you would know that I'm thinking domestic, I'm thinking... Uh, external, I'm thinking domestic, this nature of it, or external, that this is how I intend to do it. You don't just go blank. No, uh, something in practice, you see, the, as we speak, for, I can speak for the Ministry of Finance, okay? We have um, a whole broad framework of debt sustainability. I don't know what example that I can give without giving much away. So, for example, if uh, the way the IMF looks at debt, and the things they want to include in the debt, that would even take us to a particular path. In some of them, the ministry or the government may probably have a different position to it. For example, we know where usually in Ghana, where a lot of the everyday debt analysis focuses on central government debt. And I'm saying this more as a professional, not I don't want. To. So when you add other debt, I said it from some of the SOEs to it, then your debt framework becomes more elaborated and then the fund can say that within this particular framework you have to do a b and a, a b c and then the adjustment that is then required is what is even going to inform what you are going to do so for example when you if you want to say is there going to be a haircut what should be the approach of any restructuring these are decisions that you take when you know the extent of the adjustment and i think professor Bob Payne or someone make a good point. Any adjustment, and you also reiterate, any adjustment will not only be debt. You see, first, actually, the real issue is that you have to start from your fiscals, mm. your expenditure, your revenue, and then you see it has to be more holistic. But you so. agree, like uh, Dr. Theo stresses, but there's a need to do something to give a certain assurance, at least. <clears throat> of course, not for the sake of it and to intend to deceive the public, and particularly those who have investments, but to be real with them and to carry them along 
in a manner that there will not be a run on the banks. Because already you would know that people are exercising their options. Yeah, but Samson, I mean, quite frankly, as a professional, that is why I'm here. I mean, the Bloomberg report came out um, last week talking about debt restructuring. In their rights, they, they would have to do their analysis mm. and come up with it. Uh, Bryce Simmons and co. have also uh, done some work, and they have a view on what needs to be done. Mm. And so what I'm explaining is just to, to calm the market. It's, it's important for them to understand how practically the workings between the IMF and the ministry and the Bank of Ghana and the team is going. Because if today the ministry knows that we are coming to do maybe a debt restructuring of this, it will be communicated to, uh, to the market in a way that that will, uh, that will not be disruptive. But as I said, it is important for the market and everybody to know that there will not be a debt restructuring without an extensive engagement with the market. Mm. And I also indicated that it's important that, uh, as a ministry, this whole conversation about something that needs to be our debt is industry or market-led. Mm. Uh, so uh, how, do you, how do you, for example, calm the market in the midst of the further downgrade you know, of the junk status? And there was an immediate reaction, according to some of the international reports, there was an immediate reaction uh, as regards how our bonds are faring. Uh, that's not yeah, good. No, Samson, the truth is that, you know, immediately we were downgraded into the C category. Mm. You know, that was a very uh, difficult uh, situation for the country. As we speak, I mean, if you look at the yields, you know, at the local level, we are doing about 40, uh, 40 pesos to, uh, to a city. At the international level, I think we are doing between 50 to 60, uh, you know, a cents to a dollar. So really, the, the, the impact of the credit rating agencies on, the, on the, the domestic debt market is something that both the domestic and external uh, market is something that we cannot, uh, we cannot pretend so, about. So as, but we, as we speak, the, the real concerns of people, so listen to this gentleman, for example. He says, I have never taken a vacation. I have sacrificed little pledges for my entire working life for my retirement. <clears throat> I don't remember the last time I took a vacation too. Uh, I get complaints. Now, he says, my, for my entire re, um, working life, to save for my retirement, which is close, government officials have lived lavishly like it's nobody's business. I did not save with men's gold, but with government. People will have heart attack if you touch their bonds, which has already lost so much. Mm, yeah, um, some, I don't know. Can I come in? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you see, we, we, we are finding a solution for people's savings to be protected. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, if uh, what we need to do. For example, as I said, if you look at our bond market now, what is happening? A lot of institutions are struggling to even get liquidity out of the bond market because of the downgrades and, uh, and all the distortions that are happened to the market. We need a solution that brings the market back for people to be able to have a more functional market and get the economy to work. So, but what it, so everything that the government does, it is important that we would protect those savings in a way that there will be minimal disruption to, to any exercise. Mm -hmm. And I think that these, um, these concerns from, uh, from Bright and the team, therefore, is important. So I, I don't think people should panic because the government is just going to come and say that, look, you know, we are going to take a, maybe some money from you. But it is more about providing a comprehensive solution so that the economy gets back, the market becomes functional, and people's savings are, are protected on average. Mm. Right. So the... the you, do you agree <clears throat> with the the salad of you know suggestions that are coming in about government taking further you know or a more a bigger haircut so to speak to sort of give a certain signal to the public that look we are not just comfortable and living lavishly and waiting that you should you should suffer so that 
should cut down on its size and expense. Yeah, I mean, is the ministry I thinking would, like this? Yes, to be honest with you, I would answer this question more broadly on the policy side. Quite frankly, I mean, the ministry announced. You know, if you if you if you observe what the ministry has been doing over the past, uh, I think about six months. We've been, the ministry has announced a 30 percent expenditure cut, and that has been ongoing, yeah. very aggressively. You know, it's, uh, and but you know what is more important for us to know is that there are so many rigidities in our budget, and a lot of those rigidities are things that will take a very long time to address. And these are the things that I, I think Prof, Prof, uh, Professor Bobin is talking about. If you look at, um, for example, you look at our fiscal expenditure. Uh, in the full 2020, 2022 budget, you know, we have about 20, uh, 20 billion, including get fund going to the Ministry of Education. Out of that, you know, you have about 70 uh, percent going to compensations. And these compensations, what's on the aggregates, is creating a problem. At a micro level, income levels are very low. So the, the reforms that we need to do so that we can improve incomes and make sure that we improve productivity are very important. But those conversations, if you miss them with the macro, this and then it becomes very, uh, but the, because these are legacies that have been inherited since, uh, you know, 1915 mm -hmm. and seven and before. Is there, is there anything else of, of uh, special attention for you that you want to yeah, speak to? Yeah, there are many, there are many other issues that mm -hmm. I wanted to speak Yes, please to. go ahead. But yeah, so I think I will go back to explain about the IMF, uh, it's more important about the IMF program, and then what would be happening. So, uh, so from next week, when the IMF comes in, a more detailed, uh, like there will be a negotiation, an agreement on the DSA and what needs to be done. And then based on that, a, a clear position will be known, and then steps will be taken uh, as to how we can engage the market and those difficult conversations can be had. And again, it's important for me to stress that uh, you know, those, no decision will be taken without extensive uh, conversation, and nothing will be done. I mean, to, uh, for example, uh, the government spent about 25 billion cities to, to, to stabilize the banking sector. So it is important that, you know, nothing is done to compromise the banking system and to destroy people's confidence in, in the financial sector as a whole. Mm -hmm. You know, even, the, you know, we have asset fund, uh, asset managers, we have the pension sector, all those people need to be protected and any decision that is taken must be taken together listening to your friends it doesn't look like you really have much of an option when you no, say nothing will be done uh, as far as the banks are concerned it does look like the the options but that, but are open and closed no something the options are not open and closed you see as a country we can't, we, we can't think like this. The truth is that you have, for example, the reason why I will not be able to say one particular thing is because, as I said, any decision that the government takes must be industry-led. Their MPV, uh, for example, it might be that after the negotiation with IMF and an, an agreement on the DSA, maybe the, the adjustment that is needed in debt doesn't require anything close to a haircut. I, I don't know if I'm so. It, it's not very, uh, you know. I understand why the analysis will say this because, of course, I know that. But if you are within the Ministry of Finance, the job is that you have to do whatever you can to minimize the impact so that the the economy is not disrupted. Okay. And so, uh, it is important for us to know that yes, we have a difficulty, but it is not a difficulty that we can sell through. It's not a difficulty. I mean, this is. Uh, it's not something that working together it cannot be solved. And we've never been here. Yes. No. In yeah, the IMF program? No, we've never been in this situation. In terms of I hear our debt bedding yes. and clearly we've never been here. No, it's not clear. I'm trying to our debt bedding, how much of that is um, the percentage of GDP and so on. So I'm saying we've never been here. So oh. we are in a situation. Oh, yeah. I don't no, you know, but Ghana's history with this is not the first time we're having sort in a debt relief. They are of different forms. No, that's not what I'm saying. Yes. That yes. this is the first time we are going to the IMF. Of course. No, not. even debt relief. Okay. You know the famous uh, <laughs> hippic. Right. It's a form of debt relief. That's right. Yes. Mm. So I'm just 
Well, but the truth really is, I don't, you know, in our history, because of the structural issues mm. that we've been talking about, it is very important for us to know that unless we correct those structural issues mm. over the medium term, the flip. Let's see if there's see some, some one other important uh, yes. issue so, that they spoke about you want to re react to or, you know, touch on. And you're on News File. This is your most authoritative news analysis platform. Uh, we apologize to our second set of guests for the next discussion that is going to be delayed just a bit. But please hold on there for us. And when we come to you, please, let's just go to the juggler on uh, discussing the solutions for that issue where the NDC is very, very uh, livid about. Yes. So I think uh, maybe if I have to I think that it is. Uh, for us to know that, especially in the more difficult conversation about the debt, everything will be done to make sure that the financial system is, is protected and is stabilized, uh, and that you know, a lot of uh, actions will be announced, especially when an agreement is reached with the fund, to make sure that extensive engagement uh, is done with the market uh, so that we don't have the disruptions and that there is no need for any substantial uh, panic. I also think that the, it's also important to say that on the broader negotiation with the IMF, I think Prof mentioned uh, also another issue. Yes, a domestic uh, recovery program is being worked on. It is be, it's going to be discussed with the fund. And when an agreement is reached, it is then that it will be published. Mm. So that information too uh, is something that will be made. Uh, because of the fund engagement, it is very difficult to put information out if it is not, there is no mutual agreement as to the extent of adjustment that the fund would work with us to to achieve and otherwise. So I think that those are my, my three immediate... Um... Okay. Um, gentlemen, um, I'm coming to you strictly for just a minute of um, your final comment. Just a minute. I'm holding you to that. Um, Professor Bokwing. Hello, Professor Bokwing. Something. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. I think... Um... It's quite um, heartwarming listening to um, the director of finance, yeah. uh, uh, financial sector ministry of finance. I think that he's been quite candid whilst trying to be diplomatic as well. Uh, I, I think that um, um, what has been lacking, I'm sure you will agree, having been in industry, is that uh, we don't need to necessarily wait for an agreement with the fund before we have regular updates to the market. Our economy must still run with or without the IMF, that's very important. I think there's a lot of information out there that points to a certain direction and, and all of that. So, I, I, and as I said, um, with the rigidities, I acknowledge that, but I think the government, the government has control, the president has control over the size of government he wants to run this economy with. That he has control. Mm. That is different from the normal uh, structural rigidities in terms of compensation to employees and the rest of them. And, and, and something uh, from the Ministry mm. of Finance, you will know that if you look at Ghana and, and you compare that to our comparator countries, you will see that compensation to employees is not, the, it's not an outlier. Mm -hmm. Others are being far better than that and still preserve space for growth enhancing spending. So I think let's look within, let's look at the state-owned enterprises, let's look at the cost drivers from them and all of that company. As I said, an IMF program fund, we can pursue that, but let's look at other governance reforms that we need to do alongside to mm -hmm. make, like we say in Bible, put a new wine in a new wine skin. <laughs> Don't put a new wine in an old wine skin. All right. The old cost structure mm. won't work. All Thank right. you. An excellent way to end it. Um, Dr. Thierry Champon. Uh, yes, we took quick reactions to um, uh, some sense a point about the domestic uh, recovery that he says they're working on with the fund. I mean, the point is that I haven't really seen much engagement with the uh, public sector with other stakeholders in terms of making substantive input into the form and the shape of this recovery. Other than that, they then there's very little stakeholder buying um, in the in the process, and I think the space needs to be opened up for a much broader conversation. Um, there also the talk about the structural issues, like Prof says, these structural issues and the rigidities in the budget, etc. They are a manifestation of the politics. So if we don't fix the politics, if we don't mm. fix appointment, the governance, who runs your state-owned enterprises, if you're just bringing party boys in there who really cannot meet up those KPIs and are not qualified, then we'll still end up in that stage. So beyond all of this talk, 
fundamentally, I agree with Prof. We need big governance reforms. And that, I don't think the IMF necessarily can do that for us. We need to start internally and fix the problems. Thank you very much. I say just a few of your comments. We take a break and return to our next set of guests. Um, Brevity 2020 says, I believe inflation has direct correlation with consumption. That's price. What are our demands in terms of consumption, price structure? What can be done to tame the pressure? Uh, do we resort to dealing with exogenous or endogenous, endogenous factors? Uh, Adamson Azabri says, my wife is operating a cold store and I used to help her during weekends. I have stopped in the last six months because the price for one kilogram of chicken looks like I am robbing the customer. Martin Obing says, well, whatever the case be, whether IMF or no IMF, you have to make ends meet to support your family. How are we going to do that in the midst of all this? Uh, place, Techia says, isn't it possible to have an option that's more sound than that of the IMF? Has the IMF chalk success with every policy? Sometimes the workable solutions come from outside the box. Sefas Dapuri says, that's right. If politicians continue rejecting ideas from free-minded citizens or even the opposition, how then can we embrace ideas better than we have? No one person has all the requisite ideas to run the nation. That's why the nation adopted the government system that allows multi-parties. Let's learn to embrace ideas. Um, i return. There are some more of your messages. We'll be right back. Business means seeing the possibilities and maximizing opportunities, making sure you have a responsive support system, backs your business goals, a partner that gives you a stable platform with reliable connectivity and seamless solutions and better understands the tools required to take you to the next level. With so many moving parts in running a business, we do our best to provide you with some stability. The only kind of stability you can find with MTN Business Broadband, the fastest and most reliable internet provider in Ghana, making sure you stay ahead and stay connected because we understand what makes your business tick. Sign up today on broadband.mtn.com.gh or call or WhatsApp 0244-308-111. MTN. My name is William Kofinti, the CEO of Ad Pharma Limited. We are an organization that is always seeking innovative solutions to make our operations easy. So when our insurance agent recommended Bukia Chat to insure from Star Assurance, we did not hesitate to try it. I can tell you the process was seamless and 100 percent visual with no human intervention. We simply save number 024242. This one says zero and start your chart with Pukia. Excellent furnishing in a real estate business is a great deal for survival. My struggles as a young estate developer were cut short when I discovered Fernart Ghana. With quality furniture made from the finest woods and amazing after-sale service, Fernart Ghana changed my story with every single home I built. It's a one-stop shop that serves the interests of clients with a variety of living room and dining sets, solid wood kitchen installations, wardrobes, doors, cabinets, beds, agolas, floor parquets, and many other other wooden product that will last a lifetime. With Fernet Garner, all clients are offered the opportunity to customize furniture to their specifications, and the smile on their faces says it all. Thanks to Fernet, now your home can look beautiful with furniture that would last for generations. Visit Fernet Garner today and share my story. Locate us at Geneva Estate or Sue Accra, or call 0303-966-085 or 055-278-4097. Think wood, think Fernet. 
For decades, we have helped businesses connect with their trade partners all over the globe. From Ghana to Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Togo, Senegal, China, Morocco, France, Netherlands, and many other countries. We have made it possible to bring Ghana to the world. We have brought small and medium businesses closer to their customers across the regions in Ghana with our SME support facilities. We have brought relief and smiles to the faces of families with our employee personal loans. With our cutting-edge technology and digital support, we take the burden of complex thinking off you, making life simple. That is who we are, as close as a partner. Bank of Africa, we are indeed the African bank with the global reach. Hotel presents Fresh Anguamo with all the great delights. Fufu in a flash with Koto, Yemadie, and Akrantie. Almighty Gobe with Koko and eggs. Ish. Crispy fried chicken with rice, pizzas, and whatever else you're looking for or need to pay for. Hubtel presents Ghana's most useful app. Hubtel. Is everything you? The new football seasons have kicked off all over the world, and Betway is here to help you feel the thrill. Beat the odds this season, and you could win a share of three million CDs in prizes, including a trip to Qatar and fuel vouchers. You could even walk away with a grand prize of two hundred and fifty thousand Ghana CDs in cash. A cost to a Betway. Enter today at betway.com.gh. This advert has been approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Bet responsibly. Since the CI has not been formally laid before Parliament, we take this opportunity to call upon the EC to abandon the idea altogether. We wish to self notice that we will use every lawful means to resist this latest effort to undermine the right of Ghanaians to vote and in the process skew the electoral system in favor of the MPP. We will mobilize the broad masses of Ghanaians to wage a sustained and unrelented campaign to prevent any attempt by the EC to strip large sections of the population of their right to vote. Right. So... Uh, Sam Nete George, Member of Parliament, Ningo Pram Pram, uh, is here with us. Kojo Pumpuniasante is on the Zoom, and Dr. Srebo Kweku, as well as uh, Bryce Simmons. Why this suspicion and this particular position on what the EC is seeking to do, which it does before every election? Well, something, uh, good morning to your viewers and to yourself. It's not suspicion, it's literally fact, because a draft CI has been put before the subsidiary uh, legislation committee of parliament. So there is a document before parliament that we're addressing. When you read Regulation 1-3 of that, that, that draft that's before parliament, it says a person who applies for registration as a voter shall provide as evidence of identification the national identity card issued by the National Identification Authority Specific. I mean, so these are no suspicions. These are real statements of the fact. suspicion is about that it will be skewed, the, the elect- electoral system will be skewed in favor of the MPP. Well, certainly, because when you look at the issue of the Ghana card, a, a national identity card issued by the NIA, you're referring to the Ghana card. Right. This is seeking to replace the provisions in CI 126, where it says that the person who seeks to register should provide a valid Ghanaian passport, a national identity card, it leaves it open as a national identity card, and also goes ahead to include the guarantee system. There's a reason why you include the guarantee system, because of Article 42 of the Constitution, which says that, which basically sets the framework for voting rights, gives you that right. It says you must be a Ghanaian, you must be of sound mind, and you must be 18 years. Those are the only qualifications. A CI, which is subsidiary to the Constitution, is now introducing a limit to your ability to exercise that franchise. 
by saying you must have a Ghana card. The NIA on its own will admit that close to 3.5 million Ghanaians of voting age do not have the Ghana card. Mm -hmm. 2 million have not been able to register. Another 1.5 million have registered and either have not been able to receive their cards or their cards have been blocked due to administrative issues. Elections in Ghana have been decided by 4,000 people. Mm. So 3.5 million people being disenfranchised. Again, when, the CI, when, when you look at the CI that has come and you read provisions of the CI, it talks about the, the fact that you, 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 can no long, you would have continuous registration. Now, what the EC is suggesting is that you're going to have a register that is going to be the function of multiple laws. Or multiple CIs. Yeah, because continuous registration is already captured by the CI. Yeah, CI. You understand me? So why do you want to do a special CI now for just continuous registration? If that's really what you claim you're talking about, if what you're looking at is not to do gerrymandering. Again, something. Where you come from and where and a constancy, my constituency, for example, my EC district office. And the continuous registration is going to happen at district offices. At first we used to have continuous registration in polling stations. Then we agreed that it was too much of work. And so we brought it to electoral areas. And we do them in one location. And these electoral areas are a cluster of pooling stations in the same locality. Now, what the EC is suggesting is to move it to the district office. Now, if you use Ningo Pram Pram, for example, the Electoral Commission's district office is in Pram Pram. Now, you have someone in Pantrendor who wants to register. How does that person register? That person has to pick a vehicle and transport themselves all the way to Pram Pram. He has to pick a motorbike and two taxis. In Ningo Pram Pram, if the person was coming to. If the person was coming from Ochebliku, he'll have to pick a motorbike or a taxi from Ochebliku all the way to Mango Junior or Mobole, from there to Afienya, from Afienya to Dowenya, from Dowenya to Pram Pram. I mean, to get registered. And this is in the heart of Accra. I'm not going up north, where some of the distances will be 80 miles to make it to the district office. So you disenfranchise Ghanaians by, pep, by, by, by particularly taking this step. Again, the challenge there is people must be able to identify their polling stations for purposes of voting on election day. Now, a person coming from Ucheblikou who doesn't even know what the name of his polling station is and shows up in the Pram Pram office after bearing that cost is asked to register. You now leave that person at the mercy of, an, of a district officer, election electoral commission office, officer, to determine where to place that person. You could place him in a polling station that is not closest to his home. You have disenfranchised that person because that person will not be able to. Now, we hold a suspicion. Now, here we come with a suspicion. And this is to aid the NPP in gerrymandering. Because then what you will do is, you, you pick Ningo Pram Pram's register and realize that, okay, in a particular polling station, Sam George did this well in 2020. You want to drop his votes in 2024. And so when individuals from this particular polling station, which should be a stronghold of Sam George, come to register, instead of registering them in their particular polling station, you put them in another polling station, or you even punish them. Take, for example, I'll give you a community called Agoto in Ningo Pram Pram, which is under the Ningo traditional area, but politically falls under Shai Sudoku. But most of the people there register and vote in Ningo Pram Pram. So to punish that person, instead of putting him in a polling station at the Panchen or DA school, you put him in a polling station in, in, in Chayo Sudoku, or you put him, or if it's the person is somewhere around New Jerusalem, you put him in Punkatamanto. Now that person on election day believes he's registered in Ngo Pram Pram. But because you've gerrymandered and used politically minded persons to put him in a different polling station, you disenfranchise this person. These are real things that we know and see happening. And we're saying if the system is not broken, you don't fix it. We have a system that works for us. Why is the Electoral Commission seeking to change it? The last issue I'll raise, because of time, has to do with the, 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 the conduct of the current Electoral Commission. I try to stay away from personalizing issues, but you can't do that in this matter, because we sit today where we are, based on a lot of electoral reforms that were suggested by the IEA, which was, which was a CSO that contributed immensely, and you cannot take that away That's from them. Yes, okay, where we sit today as a, as a democracy is thanks to the input of CSOs like the IEA, which at the time was led by the current chairman, chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Jin, uh, uh, Jin Mensah. Yes, today, she tells us that IPAC, which was the vehicle through which IEA was able to push a lot of his suggestions and, and get reforms done, is no longer a constitutional body. Yes, we know it's not a constitutional body. But the convention that allowed us to bring our democracy to the place where today 
There's an electoral commission she can chair. She's seeking to bastardize it. Mm. The actions of the IA and the fact that, look, you, you used to have an electoral commission that had consultative processes. Now you have an electoral commission that is dictatorial. An electoral commission that puts together the modalities and the guidelines and calls the NDC that, come and let us tell you the guidelines. Who sat down to do those guidelines? You want to put together a committee to work on this. Previously, you would have, the NDC would have two reps on that committee. The NPP will have two reps. And then other political parties will have one rep. Thanks to Jim Manson's ingenuity <laughs> and, and stellar abilities. Today, the NDC is asked to bring only one rep. The NPP is asked to bring one rep. And then the rest of the mushroom parties that she's accrediting, who don't meet the, 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 the legal requirement for being regarded as, as, as political parties because they don't have offices in all 275 constituencies and are not functional, she's giving them three reps. So the NDC has one. The MPP has one. And parties that don't even have offices have three. I mean, where okay. is your mensa? Let's, let's get to interrogate these. Um, thankfully, Dr. Shrubo Koku joins us, but I would like for him to listen to um, my other two guests, and then <clears throat> he will begin to uh, share with us. And this is not the first time, you know, we have uh, dealt with this matter here on this platform, but it is being accentuated because the NDC uh, held a press conference and has stated very clearly that if this is not removed from Parliament, um, they will take certain steps. And people are a bit uncomfortable with the, with the posturing because you need a peaceful process. Um, Bright, you have had issues um, to do with the technical matters and procurement issues with these uh, processes. Um, but what do you say about the arguments made by the NDC? Thank you, Samson. I have not, um, unfortunately, I have not been able to get a copy of, you know, the address that you showed us at the beginning um, by the chairperson of the NDC, even though I've, I've tried. So I don't have the full range of issues they've raised before me. So what I will do is I'll just focus on our ongoing concern with two terms. One, the way the identification system is being implemented nationwide, which is leading to serious infraction of rights, and rather than encouraging the uh, exercise of rights, this ID card is actually now becoming something that suppresses rights. All of us supported national ID. I remember that Imani was part of the World Bank group that was put together to think through these matters as far back as 2012. We wrote detailed reports about it, and we've always been very supportive because a lot of people cannot afford passports and some of the other ID cards that prove that they are Ghanaian. So a free nationwide multifunctional car is a great thing, but it should come to enhance people's lives, come and enrich people's lives, not become another instrument with which the elite beats poor people, marginalized people, uh, underprivileged people. The second ongoing concern we've had is with this year and the way it does a stance. In I, we've had, you know, electoral commissions come and go. This is the first time we're having an EC that fundamentally, fundamentally refuses to engage with stakeholders to come to consensus on any matter of national interest. I don't know why. Every time they come up with an idea and people raise legitimate concerns, they brush it aside and they try and use power to bull those through. Let's take this EC uh, decision to use only the Ghana card as an example. It does not make rational sense. Very simple. When you go for the Ghana card, there is a set of requirements that you must meet to prove citizenship and link to that identity. Because citizen and identity are interlinked. Knowing who you are establishes whether or not you are Ghanaian. Those are primarily the things that the, the Ghana card can achieve at this stage of implementation. They've said so many things about its use in other areas, but at this stage of implementation, it's primarily to prove citizenship, or if you're a legal resident in this country, to prove you're a legal resident and to prove identity. And the Ghana card accepts, as we well know, a number of different types of identity proofing measures. <laughs> they accept a birth certificate, yeah. they accept a valid passport, right. and they accept an oath of identity. In fact, a relative, one relative, just one relative, 
can come in and say, I am the relative of this person, and I say he's Ghanaian, and they have to give you a Ghana card. We cannot understand how, if that is possible, if that is possible, then when it comes to the case of the voter, you are saying that the same things that I used to establish my citizenship and identity in the case of the Ghana card is not acceptable when it comes to the citizen. Hello. Yes, you are on right. So first point is that we are only looking at two terms. Proof of identity and proof of citizenship, and they are interlinked. If one government institution that is established to decide if somebody is a citizen or just who they say they are can accept a passport, a birth certificate, and witness testimony, I can understand why another state institution whose job is to let allow someone to do something based on whether or not that person is a citizen. To that regard. And then they say, well, if you go to the uh, uh, Ghana card registration point and you manage to use a relative to prove that you are, you, you, you are Ghanaian and then you are issued with a Ghanaian or a citizen uh, ID card, we will accept that. But we will not allow you to use the same mechanism that you used to establish your identity and your citizenship mm. at the first stage. Right. In our case, makes no sense. Absolutely makes no sense. Okay. The second point is that the challenge proceedings A Ghana card, where when you are trying to get the Ghana card, mm. there is room that is made for people to be challenged. That's right. Similar ones exist at the EC as well. Now, the argument is that if the EC claims their goal is to prevent people from uh, being challenged and etc., and creating chaos on the grounds, then they cannot use the Ghana card because within the Ghana card system, it's itself a basis for challenging people who may have unscrupulously acquired the Ghana card. And people come to the police, uh, the registration center to register. Secondly, the point that have been made that the Ghana card have additional credentials, like the digital address, etc., etc., are irrelevant. One, because primarily we are focused on citizenship and identity, not where people live, mm. not whether people sell uh, rice, not whether people have diabetes, not any of the mm. other ancillary benefits that people have said the Ghana card will give to us. In fact, some of those I, I requirements for the Ghana card are perhaps unconstitutional. The requirement, for instance, to have a digital address. We have 5.4 million people in Ghana who live in slums, many of whom are actually homeless or have no fi place mm. of fixed abode. Mm. To require that they have a digital address is more or less to exclude them. And if that is the requirement to get the Ghana card, which means that it's higher a requirement, mm. we cannot require that if people that are coming to vote where the requirements are simply citizens with identity, go for a card where there are higher requirements. It doesn't okay. make sense. All right. Lastly, mm. we have problems with chaotic management, things which are not planned through. We saw this th the same thing with the same registration, where we didn't recognize that diplomats are exempt from having the Ghana card. And then we proceeded to try and create a situation where we will have registration based on Ghana card, whether or not you are a foreigner or a citizen, and then realize later that diplomats have to be exempted. And we're trying to force the telcos to make adjustments to these things while the blocking process was underway. Things like this create fundamental concerns, as well as the fact that the government itself is in breach of its own regulations. The right. regulations that they are used to require tells us that you must give me my Ghana card in 30 days. Mm. The way the, the, the express uh, 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 claim there is that the, 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 the card must be given to you in 30 days. It's not happening. If that is not happening, on what basis, if the government itself is in breach of the law, can you force someone to have the Ghana card mm. as a mechanism of okay. exercising a very important uh, right. All right. Many people, well, they don't even have biometric registration. Mm. Majority, we have biometric registration. When I come to the EC, like this is to show you the Ghana card, they will register me biometrically. This makes Ghana one of the few countries that one third or so of countries around the world okay. where you have such strong security mm. measures. Yeah. And it's enough. Okay, Brian, because of because of our time limitations, let me go to uh, Dr. Kojo Pumpuni Asante. Um, let's hear if we can have you. Uh, your rendition or view of this situation in the next uh, five minutes so that we can have a bit of some time for the Electoral Commission to respond to them. Yes, Dr. Kojo Pumpuni Asante. Thank you. I hope you can see me. Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, yes. All right. Good. Okay. Um, well, thank you. And uh, uh, good afternoon uh, to every, uh, good morning to everybody. 
Um, I think, I, for me, really, we have to be really careful not to throw the baby with the bathwater on this matter. And I'm really hoping that, you know, the NDC, the EC uh, stakeholders can move forward on, the, on this issue. Because for me, it's not a complicated matter uh, that we should be splitting hairs on. Uh, first of all, I, I, I attended two um, um, uh, IPAC meetings when uh, these matters were being discussed and subsequently uh, i also received reports when i didn't attend i received reports of deliberations on these matters um this is the the issue of, about this is not uh, just happened today uh you have to go back to 2016 uh when uh, i think ci 91 it was very clear that we had decided as a country that we need to move from this sort of periodic voter registration you know, process that, you know, brings all kinds of violence and manipulation and so on to a continuous registration system. And the, the, the law, even in CI 91, was very clear that the Electoral Commission had to develop modalities in consultation with the political parties, the registered political parties, to set out how this was going to be done. And the EC, uh, after 2020, I think even before 2020, there, was a, there were, had been attempts to discuss these modalities, but it didn't, you know, go anywhere. After 2020 started these processes through IPAC to discuss it. And if you read the IPAC reports, it was very clear that even at that time, uh, political parties raised questions about using the uh, ID as the sole evidence of, you know, identity as a citizen. And the, in the back and forth and the negotiations or discussions then, the suggestion was that, okay, the EC will seek advice from the Attorney General uh, and, and even do some pre-legislative engagement with the Subsidiary Legislative Committee on these matters before uh, the process will be laid. So I think it's wrong for anybody to suggest that there's not been uh, a stakeholder engagement on this Dr. Asante, the, the NDC is raising practical challenges about no, coming, the I'm, implementation I'm, 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 if the CI is passed in the form that it is. You are saying this if, is not something that me, this is not something that there should be here. No, if you allow about. me, what's the way forward on it? I'm building a, I'm building a, pre, a pre, I had to state that premise because it's important, you know, that we state what is factual. So. What I was saying is that the NDC has not been on, on IPAC for a long time, and I know that they have stated their reasons why. But I know also that, yes, they send them copies of what the deliberations are and all of those things. Now, the assumptions that were made at that time was that the, electro, uh, the NIA had begun this process of, uh, uh, using the, uh, of registering people, and there was a certain expectation that they could reach certain numbers. Now, this was almost... This is going back 2021, you know, matters. Certainly, the, the environment has changed. The NIA has clearly told us that uh, what they have registered, the challenges they are having, and given our economic challenges, are unlikely to reach those numbers. So for me, it's a very simple matter. Certain assumptions were made that, oh, if people are turning 18, and remember, this is about continuous registration. Mm -hmm. It's about those who are turning 18. And yes, from 2021, so now, if you look at the numbers from statistical service and so on, you could have over you know, 2 million or so people who will fall under that category. And therefore, it means that if you insist on using NIA, you are going to have a definitely disenfranchised people. So based on the assumptions that were made, that now, given the realities on the ground, that's not. I don't see why we should be quibbling about whether or not we should restore things like guarantees and so on in the text to deal with the current current matter. I think one of the other things is uh, passports. Actually, the guarantee system for passport is actually even more robust than for the NIA. So I don't, for me, I don't see any, I think the assumptions that were made at the time, which for me, I support, that we have to eventually bring everybody you know, in, under the NIA system. But you have to be practical. If it was uh, feasible then, it's not feasible now. It's not likely to be feasible by 2024. Mm. And therefore, we have to address those things. Okay. So I think we should just come.
to that reality and accept that what assumptions we made mm. uh, do not pan out now. In that regard, that. They, in that they, in that regard, should it be a withdrawal of the CI put in Parliament now because the 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 current the status quo takes care of continuous registration, takes care of your Ghana card and the Garanta system. Yeah, so so I'm actually surprised that it was laid because as I said, in even the deliberation, the the condition was that there will be a discussion with the Attorney General on even the constitutionality of limiting, you know, the identity, uh, the the production of evidence for identity, and then also a pre-legislative process with subsidiary legislation. So I thought those things would be complete. That, that would have brought the NDC in mm. and other stakeholders in to agree that, yes, we can go forward with this or not go forward with this. If that deliberation has been held and the EC is still insisting, then I think the EC then will be, will be incorrect because they, the, the reality on the ground does not that support the assumption that was made previously last year. So for me, I think that if that's the case, then you have to withdraw because, of course, the time starts to run when you lay it. Okay. The, the related mm. issue is mm. of the registration centers, mm. which uh, 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 Mr. Sam George has raised uh, issues about. And it's all, so this is all to do with the continuous registration. If, for example, we start continuous registration now and somebody is to walk in in that place, how do we ensure you know, that you know, the, everything is above board and so on and so forth? We haven't talked about, you know, maybe monthly monthly publications of people who have registered. We haven't talked about how you tie the challenge system to that process after the registration has been done in a continuous system. So I think there are ways to address this with all the knowledge. There's a lot of experienced people who have been doing this. I know that all around the world, everybody is trying to deal with attestation as a, as a way because it's been abused okay. in the past. All right. But there are ways that to, to, to solve this. And I really think that we shouldn't, you know, kind of kill ourselves around it. Let's just be realistic and factual and move forward. All right. Uh, Dr. Kujo Pumpune Asante is Director of Advocacy and Policy Engagement at the CDD. And as far as he's concerned, the ball is in the court of the EC. Uh, so it does appear that at least listening around this table, the EC is alone. Dr. Sri Bokweku, Director of Electoral Services, uh, Electoral Commission. How do you respond? This will be the second time you are trying to explain this to us through this platform. Yeah, sounds and good. Uh, good morning and my regards to your listeners. Good morning. Uh, I would have wished that you give me the question for me to answer. But first, uh, let me address uh, the issue. Uh, I think Dr. Vanessa made a very uh, important statement that this, um, when anybody says that you are not being dialoguing, then the person may be far from the truth. Because uh, immediately after the 2020 elections, uh, as part of the reforms, we decided to reactivate the control registration. So we had a lot of dialogue with stakeholders, including our normal APAC people. And you know, APAC is for political parties, but we allow CSOs uh, and that would development pertain to be part. So it is something that we have deliberated on it not less than five times. So that is it. And with respect to the NDC, when we were doing the review of the 2020 elections, it was at that part group that they said that any meeting that we will call that has the 2020 election as part of the agenda, there will not be part. So initially, our understanding was that they don't want to discuss the APAC at the 2020 election because they were in court. But later, all these developers that are coming in, but, uh, I think they are new development because they were not part of the reason why they worked out of the IPAC. The main issue was that they were not ready to discuss the 2020 election. So that is the best. As Dr. Pumpurin said, all our meetings will invite them, and when we finish, to we send them uh, copies of the minutes. Again, the details that people are maybe losing sight of is that it is part of the CI that after the CI has been passed, the committee will sit and discuss the detailed modalities of the implementation. So it is within the implementation that some of the issues that they are raising could be addressed. 
Now, on those two are saying they are registering people at the district, which my brother Sam George raised, what, is that people will not know their the polling station, which uh, is not true. Because if you look at the 2020 registration, we reserved the district offices for the vulnerable. So those people who, people with disability, like taking mothers, and advanced pregnant people, uh, a lot of people, the people who are 65 years and above, they all registered in the district. But they were assigned to the police station. So this is how it works. You, you, agree, you, you agree that it's on a minor scale and this is going to be on a rather mass scale. But beyond that issue, he also raises the question of, you know, cost if to I, the I, voter. I, if you allow me to, to land on that. Please go. This is not the first time we are doing research in the district office. So what happens is that, something, you know where you are coming from. So we are expecting that when coming from the house, you know where the people within your locality vote. So you will come and tell us that we vote at this place. So uh, from what we want by your description, we have the table that will tell you, oh, this is the place that we put you there. If you have, and I'll be surprised that somebody who is 80 years and of sound mind will come to our district office and he doesn't know his locality. In that case, you don't even qualify to register. So the person who is coming should be able to describe his or her locality to us. And based on the description, if you know the police station where your parents or your relatives are voting, you tell us we'll put you there. But if you know, don't know by your description, we will put you at where you are, you are coming from. Again, I don't, I, I'm not expecting somebody will come and the person doesn't know the district where he or she stays. I will be surprised. So all these things will help us to narrow down to where you should be put at the police station. And this is not a first time. Mm -hmm. We have done registration where at this is office before and we didn't have any challenge. Mm -hmm. Again, assuming we put you at the one center, what we do is that during exhibition, you go to the center, you indicate that I should be put at the police station A, but I was I was only put at B, it will be rectified. So all these things will still be identified. Then with respect to the issue of disenfranchisement, I, 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 I get a bit worried because we are not speaking to the facts. The issue is that this is continuous registration. So it is not the issue that maybe we are doing registration at the end of this year and we are done. So any day, any time you get your ID card, you can go to our office to be uh, given the ID card. Again, by the figures that we know, that it is 450,000 per year. So we are looking at around 1.8 people from 2020 to 2024 to be added to the register. It's not the whole new register, but just about 1.8. 1, 1. So we believe that... Dr. Kojasanti, Dr. Kojasanti, Dr. Kojasanti, Dr. Kojasanti was saying, Dr. Kojasanti was saying that all of what is being rolled out was based on some assumptions, and that clearly those assumptions are not working anymore. So, is it more prudent or not to pause and re re keep on with the status quo? And then perhaps look to do this after the next election. Is that is that something the EC uh, wants to think about? Our decision is based on the assumption that by the time we post registration on the seventh of October, twenty twenty four, any eligible voter would have registered. So that one is still valid because we can fathom that for two years the one for people cannot register. And then he has given us all the assurance that now that they have rolled, they have rolled out 291 decision centers, and we have go to roll out 267 decision centers, the people will have their uh, names on the kind of card. All that challenges will be rectified. Mm -hmm. And from them, they are saying that by the end of 2022, all the challenges that we are talking of will have been addressed. So they will get a card, they will come to our offices, and they will, uh, they will register. Now, mm -hmm. something, let's do this challenge. We have more than two years. So let's give, let's roll out the control as they say. Let's give ourselves up to the end of 2023. If genuinely there are people who are not getting the card, then we can now be arguing the argument we are putting across. What happens if by the end of 2023, everybody who wanted to raise out the card, then all the arguments become moot. So I'm thinking that I'm believing that in this world, if you don't plan, you plan to fail. So it is part of our planning that we want to eliminate non-Ghanaians 
helping us to choose our leaders, which it can, cannot be done in any way in this country. If you go to other countries, recently I was in the, uh, and, and, uh, Kenya, I've been to uh, Mali, other countries for elections. They all use their citizen card. So I don't, I don't, I, personally, it is not the responsibility of the electoral commission to identify who was the candidate. That work has been given to the National Education Authority. So we shall allow them to do their work and mm. who will benefit from the fruit of their work. So in, this is my pronouncement. Oh, you don't have time to. Mm. Uh, yes, yes, we, we have just about some two minutes to go. But my, my question to you, really, I don't think you've answered that. Uh, my question to you is that you listen to such an important stakeholder like the NDC. Of course, he, when you're running elections in Ghana, general elections, you're running for NDC MPP. I mean, we can't run away from that. And then you <laughs> hear them. We have independent candidates either. Yes, we know. Um, we hear them consistently complain about this. And you have CSOs, you know, very credible and important CSOs, like the CDD, like Imani. And right here on this table, I said, you are alone as the EC. Is, are you giving yourself an opportunity to rethink okay. this? Something. That must be what about, uh, about taking political parties uh, who were part of the decision making. Sure. If we are uh, alone, it was a decision of the APA. What about the APA? I, I will get to the, the APA minute yourself for you to read. These, are the, read. these, are, the parties, that, these are the parties. These are the parties you are you are seeking to throw out because they don't qualify to be I, parties. I'm not, I'm not giving any party you are throwing out for now. <laughs> they are part, political parties who are, who are in our books. So we take a decision to expand any of them. They are political parties, okay. and they were part of it, and including the. CSOs. Okay. So some of the CSOs were part mm. of the upper uh, right. It's not the issue of I I, I talk commission alone. Okay. Uh Sub George, you, you you are in parliament. Um you have a delicate parliament, you know, divided right there in the middle. So others will say, use your numbers. Well well, we don't when we say down the middle, yes, they still have a slim majority. And so when it comes to taking the yeah, number one person one majority, person majority mm -hmm. and you just need one, one, one person. But you see, Dr. Sri Bokoko is talking theory. I'm speaking practicality. When he talks about the district level registration that was done, where vulnerable people were sent there, does he know the expense to the political parties to ensure that we had people escorting the people there? Does he know the challenges that really happened? They may sit in the comfort of their offices in the Electoral Commission and assume what goes on on the ground. We are on the ground. We are the implementers of their decision. Again, how do you suggest that we should sit back and allow you pass a CI that is injurious to our democracy, and then we should come back and discuss the modalities? If you were minded to engage us in discussing the modalities, you will present a CI that will be reflective of everybody's wishes. Is there not some forward? time that you can concentrate on saying, look, we want to make it work, rather than throw it away? In all fairness and honesty, when he makes references to the likes of Kenya and Mali, they don't have a constitution in, like the 1992 constitution that sets out the criteria for what is okay. gives you the franchise. And let me just land Sorry, here. We have, we have in, in wrapping up. I just want to call on the EC to realize that today they, have, they constitute the biggest threat to our democracy with their recalcitrant position. All right. We'll uh, urge them. We'll urge them to go back to the table and consult. This has with been the political files, parties. And uh, my guests have been Dr. Sreborg. Uh, Director, Electoral Services of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Kojo Pumpuni Asante, Director, Advocacy and Policy Engagement, CDD. Sam Naite George is Member of Parliament, Ningo Pram Pram. Bright Simmons, Vice President, Imani Africa. Earlier on the economic matters, we engaged Dr. Theo Champong, Economist and Political Risk Analyst, Professor Godfrey Bokwing, Economist, uh, UGBS. And we also had uh, Samson Akligo.